Hey, everyone, it's Alan Schimmel. You're watching Tech Strong TV here from our digital anarchist studios in Boca Raton, Florida, streaming to the world. Thanks for joining us. Today is Thursday, uh, April 23rd, and we've got quite a, a show in store for you. Um, first of all, uh, I'm just, I assume most of you have been at least seen this show once or twice before, what we've been doing. But for those who maybe aren't familiar, we started this when the COVID-19 uh, quarantine came into effect. And we thought, hey, who wants to listen to the bad news on the mainstream regular news shows all day? Maybe we do some tech news, tech uh, interviews for our tech audience here. We, you know, at MediaOps, we do, we cover cloud native, cyber, DevOps, uh, digital transformation, and we thought people who are into that may be, you know, working from home right now and looking for for information and news to keep them, you know, connected to the community. And, you know, the tech community is a strong community, but it thrives on communication and collaboration. And that's kind of what we try to do here. We try to bring you a, a good mix of, of different uh, news and interviews. Most of it is new, recent interviews, but we do go into our archives and bring you, you know, some of the best of what we've had over the last five, four or five years here at uh, MediaOps and DevOps.com. So hopefully you get a good mix of that. And today's show is really no different. It, 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 it features a really great mix of um, content. Let me tell you what we have on store for today, and then we'll dive right into it. First of all, I, I have a video interview with a company you may not be familiar with. It's called Adea. They're out of Switzerland. I am speaking with Francois Rodriguez, one of their uh, executive team members. And Adea actually uh, has been providing secure communication platform to the Swiss Army, to the Swiss Armed Forces uh, for the last uh, seven plus years, I believe. And really with all of the news we're hearing about security, uh, breakdowns, vulnerabilities, bugs in, in some of the uh, video communication tools and that we're using while we're all working from home, Adea offers a, an alternative, a, a, a Swiss made security, a secure communications platform that was built with security in mind from the ground up. And I'm not here to bash Zoom or anyone else. You gotta remember that a lot of these solutions were consumer grade, where the Adea platform is actually kind of military grade. But we're, we're gonna hear more about that from Francois. Um, after Francois, uh, after Adea, we're gonna talk to the one of the maintainers of one of the most successful projects under the CNCF Linux Foundation, and that's FluentD. We're going to uh, speak with Eduardo Silva about recent developments around FluentD. You know, they have over a thousand plugins that, that help people with that. And uh, Eduardo will tell us more. And then after that segment, we have another good interview with Mark Hinkle over at Trigger Mesh. And, you know, Mark is going to tell us how Trigger Mesh is helping organizations, whether you're in hybrid, multi cloud, um, serverless, uh, cloud native integration and deployment. So Trigger Mesh is pretty cool. Mark, of course, was interviewed by uh, John Willis last week. And we're going to dive into some areas maybe that Mark and John didn't touch on in this interview. And then uh, after that, we're going to pull one out of the archives. I'm going to go back. You know, we've been putting on the DevSecOps event at the RSA conference now for about five years. This one's from about two years ago. It features three women who are just, well, they're leaders in, they're leaders in the space. But more than that, just really brilliant. <laughs> um, I have Shannon Leitz, Paula Thrasher, and Carolyn Wong. All three of them are, as I say, just brilliant, brilliant folks. And they're going to be talking about security is the center of a DevOps world. This is a presentation that they gave at RSA conference, DevSecOps event, and, and I think you'll enjoy that. After that, we'll come back for the news. And then over to Charlene O'Hanlon, our managing editor, editor, who has an interview with Debbie Gordon from CloudRange uh, CyberOn. 
And then after that, of course, it's time to head over to the analyst corner with Mitch, Mitchell Ashley, our CEO, co-founder of um, Accelerated Strategies. And Mitchell today, <coughs> excuse me, Mitchell has some uh, two, two segments. One, one is his own. He's going to talk about um, working from home and, and some of the stuff, you know, around what, what's going on in, in how we're changing our businesses as a result of COVID. And then he has a good video with uh, Vince Campitelli, and, and Mitchell will tell you more about that. Uh, and then I'll come back for closing remarks. So it sounds like a great show. Stick with us. We're going to take a short commercial break, and we'll be right back. Tech is strong. We may be working from home, but tech goes on. Tech will continue to collaborate. Tech will continue to communicate. Tech is strong. Join us for Tech Strong Con, June 4th, 12 hours strong, tech strong. Featuring John Bacha Galupe Willis, Shannon Leitz, William Hurley, Jasmine James, Kat Swatel, Cornelia Davis, James Wickett, Courtney Kistler, Damon Edwards. Live Q&A with speakers, exhibit halls, and more. Free, but register before spots fill at techstrongcon.com. Hey, everyone. Back here at the uh, Digital Anarchist Studios. So, as I mentioned, our first interview today features Francois Rodriguez, one of the executives at a company called Adea. Adea is a Swiss company that recognized the need for a secure communications platform 10 years ago. And they developed a platform that has been in use by the Swiss Armed Forces for many years now. And, and over the years, it's grown. It's grown from just email and simple messaging to audio and video. And it really, you know, today when we're looking at uh, potential secure video communications because of uh, processes and vulnerabilities, et cetera, with Zoom and others, I don't want to pick on Zoom here, I, you, we use it here, um, but Adea offers a, a, a secure alternative and uh, it, it's it's battle tested. It's military grade, and I, I had the I met Francois for a podcast about three or four weeks ago, so I invited him back on because I wanted to share the Adea story with you, and uh, I think you'll find it compelling. So now let's go over to Francois Rodriguez with Adea. This is Digital Anarchist. Hey, everyone. Okay, we're here for our interview with Francois Rodriguez. He is one of the executives with Adea. And I, actually, I had the pleasure of doing a podcast with Francois a couple weeks ago. And I invited him on to Tech Strong TV because, you know, the whole issue around secure communications, whether it's video or, or messaging or email or what have you, has, has been ignited under the lens of this COVID coronavirus situation. And, it, and it's such... It's such a big topic that everyone wants to know more about. So, Francois, welcome to Tech Strong TV. Thank you, Alan, for receiving us here. My pleasure. So, Francois, as I remember from when I was helping put the, the uh, promos around the podcast together, the tagline for Adea is Swiss, Swiss protection or Swiss precision. Swiss secure collaboration. Swiss Secure Collaboration. And I, I remember you told me the story of the, the founding of Adea, but why don't you share it with our audience a little bit? So, yeah, the story of Adea was a spin off uh, from uh, the APFL, which is one of the top uh, universities around the world, which is uh, next door to us. Uh, so, the, the, the mandate at that time was to s encrypt voice communication for. Uh, for basically uh, a Swiss army here uh, at that time in uh, using Nokia Symbian uh, operating system. So a long time ago. Sure. And uh, then we expand into, uh, you know, the, the smartphone devices with the advent of the instant messaging, uh, file sharing. And now we uh, develop the video calling, uh, which is uh, super needed when you are on the move and especially with the COVID-19 remote worker situation. Yeah, I mean, certainly I, I don't think anyone might have anticipated 
the the criticality of of this video communication and messaging you know that this that this crisis has has brought about right um quite frankly many of the video conferencing tools out there they weren't let forget military grade they weren't even enterprise grade right they were in, in some ways consumer level right easy to use easy to set up easy to get on you know grandma could talk to her grandson you know and and see and and get to see them but you know, now, boom, you have COVID, everybody works from home, we need to be communicating, everybody wants to use the video in, in addition to just, you know, a phone or audio. And, and lo and behold, it seems like every other day, we're, we're hearing about, you know, bugs and security vulnerabilities and, and zoom jackings and, and these kinds of things. I imagine it, it's, it's got to have a, a big effect on your business. Yeah, you're correct, Alan. Uh, I think you, you underlined the, the point that uh, people are, tend to use consumer grade or even consumer application because they're easy to use. And uh, before the crisis, even when uh, the organization or in the, the enterprise were not providing any tool to, to the employees, they were using free tools. You know, they, they're using tools every day with their family, with their friends. And if there is nothing available officially, uh, is what we call shadow IT. Uh, they they take what is available on the market, and what is available on, on the market are you know the WhatsApp of the world, uh, very very straightforward to use, no strings attached to any billing, no uh, declaration to be made to uh, IT people, and this is where the, the the snowball effect starts because when people are getting used to those tools, it's very difficult to make the change. And, uh, and that change really appeared now with the uh, crisis situation because uh, organizations have been trying freemium tools. So tools being designed for the enterprise, but being made available for free, but they don't realize all the time that the freemium model comes attached with uh, another type of business model. When you don't pay, you pay with your own data. And uh, that's what mm -hmm. happened uh, with uh, the scandal of uh, last week. And yeah. People were using the 40 minutes free available uh, communication video, and there was uh, some communication between and you know Zoom and and Facebook uh, yeah. to to monetize that audience. There is nothing nothing is free in life. Uh, there is that, no I was life. just going to say that, <laughs> Francois. You know, I I actually had a meeting this morning, our all hands meeting here in the you know, on, on, on video and because uh, we're all remote right now. And I told people this, that, you know, especially for the younger ones who work with us, nothing is free in life. No one gives you anything. Even when they say it, for, when people say it's free, there's usually a hidden cost, which is much more money than if you would have just bought it to begin with, right? If you would have bought the right thing to begin with. And um, yeah, no doubt it is a, uh, it's a life lesson that people, I think, unfortunately, need to learn and, and learn from. Um, so I, I want to focus on the video piece for a second, and then we'll, I'd like to talk about more of, of the Adea platform and, and product offering. So how, how, does, how does your video platform differ than some of these consumer apps out there? In fact, our product uh, is is lying in in, uh, in the encryption capabilities that the product uh, in its inception has been developed for. So it's a really highest level of encryption. We started by encrypting voice, then we've been adding other functionalities. Uh, and the, the video really relies on that uh, technology. Uh, so it's really tried to uh, confine in different layers of encryption uh, the the the, com the communication infrastructure, which is making the the connection between the different users. So you can connect the users in a one-to-one -one basis or multiple point basis, uh, and ensuring that the content, even if uh, anyone intercepts the signal, is not readable. So that's the the technology that we're using behind. So um, today, nothing is uh, you know impossible to crack. It's just a question of time. 
but when you do real-time communication, you're better off, you know, having some protection around. Without that, you can expose some, some sensitive data, sensitive com conversations, especially for uh, organization or enterprise that uh, are dealing with sensitive data. So again, they are not against the free, the, the freemium model because there is a market. It was the booming of the internet in 2000 because everything was free. But uh, now we come to an era where privacy is important for users. Data protection is critical for compliance for uh, the enterprise world and, and governments. So we're really playing in that niche and that is our differentiator. So there is, you know, a, a play to, to, to be available for uh, ourselves into the compliant uh, requirements. And this is what uh, the market that, that we serve. Excellent. Francois, if you wouldn't mind, and I'm not asking you to put your prices out in public, but give us an idea of how is it sold? Is it a, a one size fits all? Is it per user? In fact, we've got three flavors of our product. We've got a, a cloud-based product that we call uh, Adaya Business, which is a uh, set for organizations that want to have something uh, quick, quick setup, up and running in a couple of hours uh, for uh, you know, executives that are uh, doing intensive travel, exposed to insecure networks and uh, high mobility. Uh, so that, that, uh, that product starts uh, with a very affordable price uh, with $9 per user per month, uh, which is quite competitive. It's coming with all the functionalities that we just described. Then we've got a more integrated product, which is called Aday Enterprise, which is integrated with uh, unified communication systems, is deployed on premise. So it's more for large organization that have their own data center, integrate the system into their core business. And uh, the third leg that, uh, that we've got in our <clears throat> secure collaboration suite is the Adeya Squad product, which is called Adeya Guard, uh, which is shielding government organizations, defense of organizations that are using virtual private networks that are clearly not exposed to the public internet or public communication infrastructures. So it's a completely mm -hmm. shield and close uh, product. Got it. So one of the questions I had is, okay, so let's say we were using the cloud product. And look, uh, communications between me and my coworkers are encrypted and everything else. But now let's say we have to do a video similar to what we're doing here. And you're not in a day a customer, right? How do I do I send you a, a special, is it an app you're going to need to download before you can get on? Is it, how, how would that work? Yes, in order to, uh, to provide the encryption uh, be between two, two sites or two users, you need to have a, an app. Uh, the, yeah. the, 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 the browser encryption product is very uh, un unreliable and uh, we, yeah. we are basically not playing in that market. Uh, we, we have the invitation feature, so any- oh, So there's an invite. Yeah, there is an invite, but obviously you need to download the, the application in order to, to prevent that uh, data leakage. And you have applications for Windows, Macintosh, iPhone, Android, all the usual suspects. Yes, so we, we serve all the platforms, the main platforms. And uh, it's quite uh, straightforward to, to download the application. And uh, oh, yes. the, the, the administration can decide, is, is this a permanent uh, invite? And therefore, you know, the user can you know, leave the, the application or you can uh, simply revoke the user after the call or after a period. Let's imagine that you have you know, some guest uh, consultant coming to work uh, for you for three weeks or three months. And at the end of the period, you just uh, delete the application from their devices and everything gets completely wiped from, uh, from, from their site. Excellent. Okay, if you don't mind, I'm gonna, I want to move away from the video and let's talk about the rest of the Adaya platform and product line, if you don't mind. Of if course. If you could share with the audience. 
Yes, of course. So the, the collaboration suite, uh, it's all about communication and collaboration. Obviously, collaboration is quite popular these days with uh, video and screen sharing. So this is uh, the, the functionality that we just described, but it comes as well with uh, voice calls. Uh, you can as well chat uh, within the video, but outside the video, uh, because mm -hmm. certain certain applications are, you know, having a Zoom, um, um, not a Zoom, sorry, a chat in the uh, video, uh, but when you, when you close the call, the chat stops. Uh, right. in, on our side, basically, you have the trail of the chat. You can organize room. You can organize uh, as well some uh, co-workers uh, dis discussions in two different rooms. Uh, so it, there is a continuity after the calls. So uh, it's, it's combining a team messaging application with the video conferencing, but as well one-to-one um, -one voice. So I can call you uh, whenever uh, I see you available. And uh, there is as well the file sharing and encryption of the, the different files that are in your, in your device works like a, a secure Dropbox, basically. Excellent, excellent. So it's, excellent. A kind of, it's, it's like a Swiss army knife. Uh, so you've got four products in in one single app. It's from Switzerland. What would you expect? Uh, <laughs> speaking of that, I, you and it's red. <laughs> and it's red. You know, we look at your background. One of the nice things about this whole everybody working from home is you get a peek into where people live, what they have, what their houses are like. In your case, we're actually looking at some beautiful Swiss mountains back there. You can see them on the background, yes. and you can see the lake. <laughs> Yeah, it's gorgeous, gorgeous. Um, anyway, so I, I guess, you know, obviously, no matter what application you're using, we're seeing huge spikes in usage of, of collaboration software like this as, as more of us work from home. <laughs> I, I, one of the questions I have is, is it, is it sort of like a snake swallowing a rat where that'll work its way through and we'll go back to normal? Or do you think this is the new normal? What will the, what will the staying power, if you will, of, of you know, these remote collaboration tools and, and messaging and video and so forth? Where, where do you think, you know, certainly for the next few months as we battle this, yes, but longer term. I think you, you, you underline a good term is the new normal. Um, there, there was an ongoing trend uh, before the, the crisis that was, uh, you know, the, the explosion, especially with the youngest generation to have uh, more and more consultants and, uh, and freelancers working in a co-working space, uh, you know, putting resources behind a specific project and then dissolve the, the team and start working on a separate project. Uh, that trend was already there before. And uh, the need for collaboration tools for that specific setup of, uh, of co-workers was already in the air since I think uh, at least six to, to seven years. Now with the, the explosion of, uh, of the crisis, uh, it's really underlined that need. And certain organizations, especially the ones that have a more classical approach that everyone needs to be sitting behind their desk eight to, to five, uh, they were completely uh, panicking because uh, they never been exposed to such tools. So they were really in a searching mode. The mentality was not there. The, uh, the selection of the tools was completely improvised. And this is where uh, some, uh, some organization were struggling with the, with the new setup. Uh, so therefore, this trend will continue Obviously, uh, it will not stay forever because I hope the crisis will, will end up uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a couple of months. But the, the trend is set now. People are getting used to that. People are you know, uh, taking the advantage of these uh, new uh, tools and uh, interworking with their colleagues in a more um, fluid way. And, uh, and, and the enterprise world will, will change for, for sure. I've been discussing with, uh, with Gartner that uh, they conduct a recent survey where they predict that 20% uh, of the permanent workers will be, uh, become uh, remote workers. I, I'll tell you, we did, you know, we, we have a, uh, an analyst firm where we're associated with called the uh, 
Accelerated Strategies Group, ASG. And uh, we did a, just a, a flash poll survey this week using DevOps.com, Security Boulevard, and social media, asking workers now, not, not their bosses, but workers, you know, once this is over, what would you prefer? Would you prefer to work from home all the time, you know, three days a week, um, or stay, you know, go back to working in the office, basically? And, and, um, and, and, the, and it was assuming your employer allowed you, right? So only 15%, one five, 15% of workers said they want to go back to their office all the time. Mm -hmm. um, something like 30% or 33%, about a third, said they would want to work more than three days a week from home. Right, and just go into the office occasionally. And the work from home all the time, work from home three days a week, were represented about 55% of the people. And then there was, there was a few other categories. But it was overwhelming that, that people are getting used to this and they'd rather do this than, than go to the office, which from, if anyone out there is in the commercial real estate business, not a good time. You might want to you might want to look at a different career. Maybe a day and need some salespeople or something, Francois. But uh, you know, it, I think that's going to be a big change. Yeah, that's going to be a big change, and uh, not only the the communication will uh, will be challenging, but the overall infrastructure will need to change as well. Because right. you don't have, you know, all the people sitting behind the desk connected to the central server permanently and you have your secure network uh, underneath. But it's really a decentralized workforce that are using mm -hmm. decentralized tools and uh, using uh, networks that are not yours. So right. how you can... And, and that, yeah, you can't, that. you can't bring people back to the mothership necessarily. You need something else. I, I, I think the other... You know, um, so this came upon us like a wildfire in many ways. A lot of a lot of organizations didn't have time to prepare to put something in place. I think once we and so so they're stuck with what they have, right? You, it is what it is. But I think once we get by this kind of emergency, and people have a chance to think about, okay. If this is the new normal, if this is where we're headed, let's put the right infrastructure in place to support it. Then we'll start seeing. I don't. I think VPNs are, are going to be a, in a, a big minority because not you know everything's in the cloud or it's SaaS and decentralized. So yeah, I think it's going to have some big repercussions as it you know works its way through the system. Yeah, and following that trend, we just uh, announced an agreement with Mobile Iron this week uh, mm -hmm. because securing the, the, the mobile devices uh, complementary is completely complementary to our solution, which is sure. you know not only securing the device, which are a, a key need for remote workers, but as well adding the secure communication and collaboration on top of it is something that we've been working hardly to, to forge these uh, partnerships moving forward. So we're really following that trend. Our, our key strength is uh, providing security mobility and uh, enabling collaboration in a secure way for the teams. Absolutely. Francois, we're about out of time. Thank you for joining us from beautiful Switzerland. Enjoy. You're um, welcome. Thank you for the hope, occasion, Alan. My pleasure. Hope to have you back on soon. But for now, this is Alan Schimmel on TechStrong TV. We'll be right back with another guest. SecurityBoulevard.com is the leading resource for news, analysis, and education on challenges facing the cybersecurity industry. SecurityBoulevard.com covers all aspects of cybersecurity, including data security, DevSecOps, cloud security, application security, network security, security threats, and more. SecurityBoulevard.com has the largest selection of security content, featuring breaking news, blog posts, podcasts, and more. Visit www.SecurityBoulevard.com to learn more. 
securityboulevard.com, home of Security Bloggers Network. Hey, everyone. Back here now for our next segment. Um, you know, CNCF has done amazing, amazing work. I think most people kind of associate it with Kubernetes as the, or as the foundation that's managing Kubernetes, but Kubernetes is just one of a dozen, maybe even more now, open source projects that CNCF is either incubating or managing. You know, they go into incubation, they graduate, et cetera. But um, one of those is FluentD. FluentD has been around now, I, I think eight or nine, maybe even 10 years. And it's really caught on. There's over a thousand plugins for FluentD. You, you may have heard of FluentD, but if not, don't worry. In this next uh, segment, uh, Eduardo Silva, one of the maintainers of FluentD, is going to give us a good background on FluentD and tell us what's going on and why it's just another great job by CNCF in, in fostering these open source projects for the good of the whole community. So let's go to Eduardo Silva now, one of the maintainers on FluentD. This is Digital Anarchist. Okay, hey everyone, thanks for joining us again. Uh, we have a good segment coming up next. I'm, I'm happy to be joined by Ed, Eduardo Silva. He's one of the maintainers of the Fluent D project, and there's been some real news around the Fluent D project recently. Eduardo, welcome to TechStrong TV. Hello, thanks for the invitation. It's our pleasure to have you here. So, Eduardo, you know, our, our uh, audience, Cloud native, DevOps, cybersecurity, people in the digital transformation, software developers, SRE, that kind of stuff. So, A, they're big open source fans. You know, B, they're real big CNCF fans. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to go over to Amsterdam for KubeCon just last month, early this month, obviously, because it was canceled. But they're still hungry for news about what's going on in the world of open source, cloud native, CNCF. What news can you tell us about FluentD? Uh, well, uh, well, FluentD is a project well established since 2011. Um, and I think that the news that I'm going to share right now are kind of news that surprised me recently. You know, the, as part of a graduated project, the CNCF just created a new report to see how has been the journey of FluentD since it's joined uh, the foundation. And one of the biggest things that got my attention, and actually I told CNCF, say, hey, hey, hey guys, are you, is this information right? Was that we got more than 7,000 contributors to FluentD. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it was really That's a wide say, base. Yeah, it's, it, it cannot be possible. Well, and, and at the end, yeah, we tracked the information, they showed me the numbers, and, and it, well, everything was right. And as FluentD, I would say that's a strong and small project as a core, but also since when the creators of FluentD, because I didn't create that FluentD, the creators make this kind of pluggable architecture. So you can create different plugins, extensions for your own need, and use FluentD as a backbone for different things. So, and right now we have more than a thousand public uh, pub plugins available, made by the community, wow. plus a few <laughs> thousand more in different GitHub repositories for different companies which are, they, are being used for their own purposes. So one of the first news I would say that is the community is still growing, okay? And, and I will be very honest, uh, I, I thought that the growth was not that uh, great. I think that was pretty normal but it was like crazy and it's still growing uh, every, well, uh, every year. So from Absolutely. a community perspective, that, that is really good because we see how the project is, is really important. And uh, most of the enterprise company cloud providers use FluentD and relies on it for their daily operations. And I think that from a maintainer perspective, that is, is, is really good. And then I think that the, the biggest, uh, I would say, congratulations goes to Masahiro Nakagawa, who's the principal FluentD maintainer. He's doing most of the 99% job of the maintaining of the core of the project. And he's from, supported by ARM. And also, well, congratulations for him. And also, well, what is new in the project in technical terms, 
I think that since last year, the team has been focused mostly on security uh, performance improvements because when working with a tool like FluentD that does a data management, there always there's one point that people complains about a performance on resource usage. But from the other angle, you see that people are suggesting more data, right? So every yeah. year, people ingest more data, they need more filters, a different way to manage the data. So we keep improving on that. And I think that that's a challenge. Uh, every user, every company has more data and we need to optimize and scale based on that. That's Excellent. from the FluentD Fluent core. Uh, security, reliability, uh, performance improvements, improvement for developers. And also as part of the ecosystem, we have this a small project, which is called FluentBet, which is like a child project of FluentD, part of the same CNCF ecosystem. So this project is, all, is always, is, well, it's getting a lot of traction. It's pretty much based on FluentD. It's written just in C language compared to FluentD that is written in Ruby. And also we have seen how many companies are adopting a uh, FluentD, but also FluentBet for different needs because FluentBet tends to be more lightweight for these scenarios when you have more data load, right? And you want to optimize on resources. Excellent, excellent. So, you know, Eduardo, I, I realize I made a mistake. I, I, we jumped right into it because I know about FluentD. I think most of our, com our audience does. You certainly do. But maybe there are some people watching this, maybe our cybersecurity audience or, you know, other folks who have logged on who maybe aren't familiar with FluentD before this. Why don't we give them, you said it was founded in 2011, but what, is, what does FluentD do? In a short, you know, description. Uh, the problem that it tried to solve is basically that uh, when you have different servers, machines, with run services, applications, at some point you need to do data analysis. But if you want to do data analysis, when you have different source of data and each data comes in different format, uh, it's not that easy. And it's not the same to handle that need for having three servers or five than having a hundred or 200, right? So how do you scale up all that uh, data information processing? And that is the problem that FluentD solves, which allows you to collect and parse information from different services, machines, or any kind of data format and centralize this information back in a database or any cloud provider so once you centralize the data, then you can do your own analysis. But we solve all this pain from data collection, parsing, filtering, and to, to centralize this for you. And that's why we have, a, as I said before, a, like a thousand or more than plugins, because every plugins deal with different kind of data sources, data formats, or different cloud provider. Excellent. And, and, and FluentD was sort of adopted by the uh, cloud native computing, the CNCF, which is part of Linux Foundation. When, when did that happen? If I'm not wrong, we joined the CNCF as an incubation project on 2016. Yep. So the project was already widely adopted, was reused by Microsoft, by AWS at some point. So it was not like a new project, right? It has been in the market for five years. And I would say that this kind of project that plays a role at a service level, uh, I think sometimes takes between three, four years or more to get widely adopted uh, by the companies. And sure. Because it's a matter of trust, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, well, we joined in 2016. And after that, we were like two years in the incubation process. Incubation means, hey, let's try to improve on governance, on the legal aspect, um, how we can keep moving this project forward to get a graduated project. And I will say that most of the companies care a lot of, about graduated project because graduated project means, okay, this is a project under the CNCF, but also it's in a neutral place. Nobody wants to use a, some software stack and get some vendor lock-in. So we are, there's a big trend on that. So being sure. in incubation and graduate, well, after that in graduation, put some kind of certification that, hey, this software has been around for years, it's been used by many companies, and plus it has maintainers from different companies. 
So if one company shuts down or it cannot pay the bills for the developers, it doesn't matter because you have maintainers from other companies. Yep. So a couple of observations. Number one, it really doesn't surprise me to see the base of contributors widening out. Because when you know when you're in a large foundation like CNCF Linux, you know the the exposure is is so much greater. But also, you have a, a project that's been around now eight nine years, right? There's there's a you know it, it, as more users, some percentage of them are are going to contribute one way or the other, whether it be code or something else. But I think the other thing, Eduardo, is you got to give credit where credit's due. The CNCF does a great job, both incubating and 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 fostering, if you will, right? As a foster parent, uh, the, the all of their projects, right? They yes, Kubernetes is huge and gets a lot of press and everything, but each and every project that the CNCF is is involved with really so benefits from that structure that they bring to it, as well as the world comes to, you know, the CNCF, it seems. And, and so, you know, is, is, this, is, is, is FluentD better because it's part of CNCF? Absolutely. Is CNCF better because they have projects like FluentD as part of it? Yes, absolutely too. Um, so it's it's symbiotic right the relationship they both help each other and and so, and that's a, that's a great thing um the the other thing i i would just mention and, and interested in your in your take on it is whether it be cncf or the cloud foundry foundation or the eclipse foundation or you know there are several not-for-profit sort of foundations that are helping to foster and run some of the major open source, you know, tools and projects that we all rely on. We're so much better off in that kind of model than we were before when one, one big brother managed or really owned a project, right? And, and so if that company went a different way or changed hands or, or whatever, the project's very existence was was at, at stake, right? Under the foundation model, we don't worry about that as much, right? You have a not only a broad base of contribu contributors, but a broad base of maintainers, a real, you know, a, 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 a not-for-profit foundation that ensures its, its survival, and more than just survival, its continued evolution and development. It's a great time to do, you know, it's very different when I first got into open source 20 years ago, 25 years ago. It's a different world. And one thing that is, uh, I think that it was really good timing uh, because I think that it was, yeah, nearly 2015 or 16. And uh, because um, at the company in Treasure Data at that moment, that's where the project born. And the project was always open source. And at some point, we realized the project was bigger than everybody else in our company, mm -hmm. right? And at that moment, the company was kind of a startup, right? We had good customers and everything, but the project was bigger than us. And I think that at the moment, we started thinking, hey, what's the next step for this project? And I think that that timing and that decision as a team was really important because at the same time, was near the same time that well, the CNCF was a new foundation and was trying to look at the different projects for different scopes. Of course, Kubernetes was there, but Kubernetes was, uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure if it was used besides uh, outside of Google at that moment. Yeah, but probably not. Was, yeah, probably not. And that was an orchestration part. But the, what about observability, monitoring, logging, and all of the components? And I think it was a really good timing for the project and for the foundation too. And of course, everything was about growth, right? We got the foundation's growth and the project growth on different angles. And it was a win-win relationship for everybody. Actually, we're pretty happy about that decision, looking back. Yeah, I would, I would it's hard not to. Um, Eduardo, so, so now we find ourselves, everyone working from home, this COVID thing going on. Has that had any effect? On Fluid D, on the on the community that you can see, or not really yet. 
Uh, I don't have the full perspective of that. Uh, I think that uh, mostly, uh, as you know, as an open source uh, project and organization, we are remote anyways, in the remote, we are distributed team. So mm -hmm. I don't have any information from the community members, but I think that for people who used to work in open source distributed teams, I think that maybe this forces switch uh, has been easily, right? Uh, well, personally, I work from home every day. So there's no big change because I have my right. setup at home. I have my internet, all my stuff. But people who used to go to the office and now switch to home, I think that has been hard. And for example, I, I have two kids, right? But my kids has been training every day. Hey, I'm working now. You have to wait a certain time. But yeah. for other maintainers or developers who are parents who and get home, for the kids is, hey, my dad is coming back home, so he's going to play with me. But that is not the situation. And I think that many people is facing that, uh, but I'm not aware about any specific case on, on, on the fluent the maintenance or developer's perspective. Great. One last thing. So, look, at some point this COVID thing goes away and we go back to whatever the new normal is. What do you think the future for Fluent D is? What, what can we expect to see there? I think that Fluent D, uh, well, Fluent D is a, a huge ecosystem, right? So we have Fluent D, the major program. We have uh, SDKs for different languages, and we have Fluent Bit, which is like a lightweight version. So I think that Fluent D will continue in the market for, I don't know, 10, 12 more years. Right, based on right. the latest reports on the latest adoption, because we still see that the, it's, it's growing in adoption and, and development from different companies. But also, I see that in the other side, Fluent Bit, which is a project that I'm not trying to promote it, but the project that I maintain, which is part of Fluent D, it's also increasing its adoption. So, well, Fluent D is deployed a million times every day, every single day. We don't have the whole numbers because uh, most of for example, every company that distributed Kubernetes in some way is using Fluentd, but we don't have those uh, public metrics. So if you are from those companies, please open the metrics. <laughs> and uh, for example, uh, in the, our public repositories, Fluentd is deployed widely every day. Fluentd, we see more than 500,000 deployments every day too. So every time that people are using more Kubernetes, deploy more clusters, they, are they need to soft login at some point. Right. Agreed. And, and I think that Fluent D and Fluent Bit are a great choice. So I think that the projects will stay for a while. I think that Fluent D will stay mostly on lo in the login part, while people will still creating extensions. While I see that more innovation will come on Fluent Bit, where we are experimenting with uh, stream processing, audit reports, or something that tries to get more data insights from the data that is flowing through the service. We are going to implement, a, we have implemented some kind of basic machine learning stuff. So, and I think that everything is moving now, not everything moving, but I think that the edge is being a, will be a critical component. Right now we have the cloud. And the edge, when I talk about the edge, I talk about where the data is being generated. This can be a Kubernetes node, can be an embedded device. But having the ability to do data processing or steam processing on this side, on the edge, is quite powerful. Um, and I think that we are, well, we are pointing on that direction. We see many use cases where people don't want to wait minutes or hours to process thousands of records to get some insights, but maybe they want to distribute that processing across the edge nodes and get some real-time data analysis. And yeah, so we are we are voting for that. We are looking for that on that direction. So we set a fluent D mostly on logging and fluent bit mostly on data processing. Excellent. Very cool. Sounds great. Eduardo, congratulations on on uh, the progress there. Keep it up. You know, these open source projects like Fluent D and some of the other CNCFs, you know, uh, people focus in, as I said earlier, on Kubernetes, but it's, to me, I always tell people it's like a big naval fleet, and Kubernetes may be the aircraft carrier, but you need your battleships, your destroyers, and your cruisers, and your frigates, and your supply ships, and if, you know what I mean? And, and this whole fleet that the CNCF is now commanding 
really is is the backbone and the and the um it enables this whole you know revolution we're seeing in software development and deployment yeah so very maybe good maybe one minute for your time sure <laughs> like a public invitation yeah Go ahead. I, I would like i would like to invite every every devops every people person that likes to write or everybody who wants to get involved in open source that pursue contributing to CNCF projects. I think that it will change your landscape in the future. Contributing to open source and a project that people is using every day, it's quite important because you can see the impact that your work is having in, in the market. So I invite everybody to contribute. And even if you're a student uh, with a CNCF, we have this new kind of uh, program for interns. So we just had an intern from India who was, she was working on on different plugins of Fluentbed, and we are going to extend uh, this work this year. So basically for students, if you have th free time and you can learn and contribute to open source and you want to get paid, I think that would be a really good uh, option. So all this information- That's on CNCF? Okay, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah, it's like a Google Summer of Code, but run by CNCF. Well, CNCF use, is using Google Summer of Code, by Aldrichi and this own program also for interns. Where do so they get we, more information? The CNCF website. Go to the cncf.io and you will learn more about it. Not just FluentD, but I think most of the <laughs> Fluent, well, CNCF projects will be there and they're looking for people to contribute and we as maintainers, we are willing to uh, make it easier for new learners on this new, on this new stuff. That's great. You know, Eduardo, there are so many young people who school has stopped for them. The, you know, the school year has been canceled or they're working from home, you know, doing schoolwork from home now. They can't go to class. This is a great way. Hey, you, you, you may have lost some time there. This is a great way to stay, get involved in the community, make a difference and get, get some great experience on your resume, too. I mean, that would look really yeah. good to be a con contributor. And, and actually, you, you, yeah, your resume becomes what you have done in public and not what have you done in private for a, for a company. Yeah, so absolutely. it's worth the investment. I think that that was my experience since I, when I was younger. So I can say that is a really good suggestion. Thank you. Eduardo Silva, thank you. And thank you for being our guest on TechStrong TV here. Best of luck with Fluent D going forward. Uh, for now, this is Alan Schimmel, TechStrong TV. We'll be right back with another guest. ContainerJournal.com is the leading online destination for centralized computing-related content. ContainerJournal.com covers all aspects of software containers, from container management, data management for containers, container security, networking for containers, to the entire container ecosystem, Kubernetes, microservices, serverless, and more. ContainerJournal.com has the largest selection of container-related news, featuring breaking news, blog posts, podcasts, and more. Visit www.containerjournal.com to learn more. ContainerJournal.com is operated by MediaOps Inc., the team behind DevOps.com, Digital Anarchist, SecurityBoulevard.com, DevOps Connect, and DevOpsDozen.com. Hi, everyone. Okay, back here in the studios. You know, uh, our first uh, repeat interviewer here on TechStrong TV is Mark Hinkle from Trigger Mesh. John Willis interviewed Mark, I think, last week. And they, they had a good chat about state of serverless and cloud and stuff. In this interview, I, I asked Mark to give us a little bit more of a background on Trigger Mesh, if you're not familiar with it. Um, automating cloud deployments, whether they be in public, private, on your own private cloud on-prem, uh, serverless or not. Mark gives us a really good description of it, as well as talking about what, what is the, what's the state of, of the art in this right now as well. So let's go over to Mark Kinkle from Trigger Mesh. This is Digital Anarchist. Okay, hey everyone. Uh, this session, as I mentioned, is with Mark Hinkle of Trigger Mesh. 
Uh, Mark, welcome to uh, Tech Strong TV. Thanks, Alan. It's great to be here. So, Mark, I don't know if you know this, but you have a, di a distinct uh, uh, status here on Tech Strong TV. You are our first two-time guest, right? Oh, you, were, wow. you, yes, you were on last week with John Willis, and you'll, you're on again this week with me. And you are the very first person to appear on Tech Strong TV twice. Don't expect anything in the mail, uh, but but congratulations and thank you very much. Thanks for having um, me. No problem. So, Mark, you know, when you were on with John last week, I don't know if we had really a chance to really share with the audience a little bit about, like, at a high level, what Trigger Mesh does. And I, I'd like to, if we, if you don't mind, let let's lay that foundation down, so people are familiar with the company, and it'll give us context on what we talk about. Yeah. So, Trigger Mesh is a cloud native integration platform, but um, some of the ways people describe us is. We're like a Zapier for cloud developers, or we're like a Amazon event bridge for every cloud. So mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're allowing applications to communicate back and forth and tie uh, microservices together to create a cloud native application. That's, that's what we do. Very cool, very cool. And you know, of course, Mark, you and I were talking a little bit off, off camera and, and we were talking about, you know, we can't ignore the obvious. We're all working from home. Uh, this whole COVID, coronavirus, whatever you want to call it, has, has really kind of been a cauldron, if you will, of forcing people to, to come to grips with the future maybe sooner than they wanted to. And part of that future is the idea of like, you know, that moat and castle kind of uh, strategy and, and keeping your, all your stuff over in the castle and we're going to VPN in across the moat and go out from the, that. That is as medieval as it comes right now and it's painfully obvious for those organizations who are trying to do that with everyone working from home. Yeah. Um, so what I suspect is that you know, those who can do and those who can't will do when they can. You know, people right now are in, you know, patch it, band-aid, spit and bubble gum mode. But as soon as some normalcy returns or whatever that is, everyone's going to recognize, hey, we got to we got to do different here. We, we need there's a reason why this cloud native and digital transformation and DevOps and all these words and phrases we've thrown around you know, shit got real for lack of a better, for lack of a better term, right? And I'm wondering what you guys are seeing. So a lot of the anecdotal stuff that I saw, and this is even beyond our business, one of the things I thought was really interesting is that as my friends in the industry are helping their, their colleagues and their customers work from home that, um, not everyone has a home PC anymore. A lot of people work from a tablet or other mobile device. And yeah. so the old paradigm was, you know, maybe we're gonna forward your work extension to your cell phone, or maybe we're gonna let you remote desk, use a remote desktop solution and assuming that they would have a PC or a Mac laptop now they may have an iPad and a gout and a Android phone so those solutions that were good enough before and I'm an ex Citrix worker or employee so I work for the CTO at Citrix they've been work they had worked on enabling mobile devices but with this kind of COVID scare and the pandemic going on that accelerates the need for your applications and your data to be available from a much broader spectrum of devices. Absolutely. And, and you know what, when you say they worked on it, they worked on it based upon a universe where maybe 10 or 15% of the people are working from home on a mobile device, right? And now all of a sudden they're faced with a universe where you know 95 percent of people are working from home and maybe 40 or 45 percent of them are on mobile devices so when we talk about scale right and and the you know the industrial strength of these things 
it, th- this is not, you know, consumer level kind of stuff isn't going to work at this kind of scale. And, and that's a problem we're seeing with a lot of companies. You know, it, it, it's crazy. Um, Mark, what is Trigger Mesh doing to help companies right now during this? It, we'll talk about what's going to happen post COVID, but right now, what are you guys doing to help people? Well, um, for the most, from a technology standpoint, we're providing, like we right now we provide our platform for free so that if um, folks want to play around with technology to integrate their legacy applications in the cloud, they can do that. Um, we still have some internal things that we're doing for our communities, but um, uh, for the most part, and, and this, is, this is the tough thing about this COVID thing, I, I really have been reticent to I personally had a problem with every restaurant you haven't been at for the last three years sending you an email and saying, yeah. hey, we're here for you. I'm like, where, we're, oh, yeah, we're here for you. where were you last month, let alone now yeah. that there's a, but, um, but for those folks that are looking to modernize and such, we do, we, we're open source contributors that have some things that allow them to build cloud native applications um, and, and enable things like, moving their, if they do want to upgrade their data centers and they have Kubernetes and they want to want to scale out in their data centers, they can move um, uh, Lambda, Amazon Lambda's functions to their on-prem Kubernetes K-native. Really? Um, we ported That's the cool. runtime so it runs on, you could rewrite, you could run your Amazon Lambda's on-premise, which is sort of the opposite of what we just talked about, I know, but if you have all this data center capacity because everybody's at home on their computers, one thing you may be considering is, you know, scaling out your existing data centers because you're not supplying on-prem folks with the same services you once were. Right, because you're not going to throw away those resources, right? So, you, you know, you, you would think they're not going to throw them away anyway, though, you know, I've seen stupider things in, in economic hard times. Um, Mark, you guys are doing something with OpenShift, I thought, as well, with the Red Hat guys. Yeah, so we've certified our platform as an operator, and the operator is just the, the uh, framework for installing applications into Red Hat's OpenShift offering. So you can install our, our platform on OpenShift. But one of the things we um, also have done is certified these sources. And in Cloud Native, programming is event-driven programming. So something changes in a system that triggers a serverless function to run in a data center on a serverless architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, we've certified uh, sources from Amazon Web Services to trigger functions in OpenShift. So Red Hat's a big soft software development and operating system company. And say you want to develop Java applications and deploy them to OpenShift. If they're reliant on services from Amazon, you can trigger them from one um, one cloud to another. And this is this is actually, and I don't want to get hand wavy and stuff, but we do democratize the development um, process across all of the clouds and your data center. And we think that's that's a pretty big deal because especially now as folks are looking at taking their brownfield applications and modernizing them. You can lift and shift them up into the cloud, or you can front end a lot of those backend systems with cloud native interfaces. And if you have a bridge between the legacy and the cloud, you can actually get things into production much quicker. So that's, that's where we think we, we provide a lot of value to the Red Hat ecosystem. Sure. And, and that's where it's at though, too, though, Mark, you know, one of the things, with hindsight, you look back and say, oh, it was so obvious. Why didn't I see it then, right? You know, I spent the last five years talking about hybrid cloud. Right? And in my mind, hybrid cloud was I used public, most likely AWS, unless I had something special for Microsoft and, and Google was just, was just out there yet, right? And, and my private data center, pri so-called private cloud in my data center, right? And that, that was hybrid to me. We missed the boat on, on how popular multi-cloud is going to be. 
that it may wind up being more popular than hybrid cloud or some combination of hybrid multi, right? No one wants to put all their eggs into AWS's basket, even if it means running Lambda back at my data center because I got the room for it. At least I've got options here. When when another pandemic can come out, a pandemic can come out in the world in a second and I got to scramble, we need those we need that versatility. We need that portability, which was, you know, at the, at, at what's at the heart of cloud portability, elasticity, you know, all of that stuff, right? And and we we originally when I, when we thought about elasticity and portability, it was well maybe I'm going to move from one AWS data center and and I'm going to have a second AWS data center that has some stuff in it too. But I'm still on the AWS cloud, right? Now we're talking about, I'm going to have some stuff here, I'm going to have some stuff in the data center, but I, I like the way the Google Kubernetes is, and I, you know, Azure, Azure does great things for certain stuff, and I, I needed it, I need it in all three, but I need them to all work together, right? And, and so, I, I think, number one, that was a big miss from all the analysts, and, and I'm not blaming them, I, I don't know who foresaw that coming. And then number two, so now you have that and we dip it in, you know, like a blacksmith making steel. We dip it into the, uh, into the hot fire of this COVID mess, which is now crystallizing. Hey, people, you've got to be able to, when, if this happens again, if something else like this happens, how do, we, how do we turn it on and off? How do we spin on the dime? How do we not go down? You know, how do we keep the, those wheels turning? And, and this is, I, I think, this is going to be a point in time, right? A, a defining moment where going forward, people are going to have to think this way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's good to be you. <laughs> I, I remember the, my great grandparents' generation talking about living through the Great Depression. Hey, and that, me too, my grandma. Yeah, and so, you know, those people didn't, keep all their money in the banks after the Great Depression. Nope. They were farmers that had milk, the big milk cans with some cash in it at all times because they saw the banks fail. And I wonder if using that analogy, when you see worldwide pandemics like this, if we're not a little bit more cautious about saying, you know, it's never going to happen. I'm not going to keep all my eggs in the Amazon or Google or Microsoft basket because you know, they'll never fail. But then again, who would have thought that we would be in a worldwide quarantine in 2020? So right. having, having a backup plan gets illustrated when you have worldwide crises like this. So I think it may, you know, illustrate that you can't get complacent with having redundancy, yeah. especially in a modern world where you have options. So you should make the most of those options. Model cloud is one of those options. Absolutely it is. And, and I don't want to be all negative with pe people who are out here watching us today, Mark. I mean, here, here, here are some of the positives with this. Number one, overall, the internet is rock solid. It, you know, it was kind of built, it was built for a nuclear war, right? To withstand uh, in a nuclear war scenario. But it, it's withstood this with flying colors for the most part. I mean, you know, people are, are, are streaming video like it's, there's no tomorrow to their houses. Um, off, you know, offices are, are shuttered for the most part. But, um, you know, the, the internet, the, ba the basic backbones and everything, the internet's work. And the cloud providers have basically rocked. I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're scaling, they're doing everything that they were designed to do, right? Um, it's just, I don't think enough companies were in a position to take advantage of that because they didn't undergo those transformations soon enough. And to your point, if, if the internet wasn't rock solid, the cloud providers weren't able to handle this and the technology wasn't where it was Can you imagine what a show this would be? Yeah. Think about where we would have been even in 99 with our Nokia push button LED screens that, that could only do SMS and not have broadband internet. We're in a, 
imagine what the world economy would have done without the technology we have today. It would have went down to, you know, 10% instead of 30 or 40% or whatever the percentage of commerce that's still able to be done because of that. So we're in a better shape than we were 20 years ago, but I think this will accelerate how fast we'll be able to weather this and hopefully we'll never have to again, but yeah, there is a big upside to it. Yeah, no, and you know, and for any, again, anyone out here watching this, if this wasn't enough of a kick in the pants for you to start really getting serious about your digital transformation and, and adopting kind of cloud native uh, posture towards your, towards your, you know, technology and, and, and your whole delivery and support, I, I don't know what it's going to take, right? If this wasn't enough to do it, so. So where, when do you, when do you, when do you, what, what are the telltale signs, Mark, that you're looking for to, to signal that companies are in fact starting to really, you know, move towards a digital transformation in a bigger way than they were before this? I think it's just the, um, if you interact with them, co those companies as a customer, a partner, a supply chain um, supplier, and the, you're being driven to require more information and more services for them. And you're, no matter which side, if it's a customer, you're, you're requesting more services and they have a terrible interface or as a supplier and you can't service the request from the customer, you're in that perfect spot for, for digital trend. You're, you're probably behind the eight ball, but if you're, you haven't made that decision yet, it's it's time to to invest in that and i think the the other thing is that these design patterns are something that's been around from the soa days in the late 90s but back mm -hmm. then we didn't have cheap technology and cheap inexpensive i shouldn't say cheap inexpensive technology pervasive broadband internet and a very very robust technology marketplace to fulfill mm -hmm. that that vision. The vision's been there forever, but we needed the internet to take off for those kind of things. And you needed the cloud. Hey, man, you're talking to someone, Mark, in the dot coms. I was one of the people who helped start a company called Interliant, and we were one of the first ASPs, application service providers. And we were offering Lotus Notes, these are blasts from the past, hosted Lotus Notes, PeopleSoft, Lawson, Oracle Apps, and Onyx CRM, if you ever heard of Onyx. I was their first customer out of Were you really? Okay. Out of Seattle. Seattle. Yeah. yeah. They were out of customer. Seattle. We were offering, offering hosted Onyx. No VMware, right? This is 97, 98, 99. No, no, no hypervisor stuff on Dell or Sun boxes with EMC storage, some IBM boxes, um, selling it on T1 lines, reselling the same T1 line over and over. You, you know that, how that Great story was. Yeah, which was the poor man's T1, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, and I look back on it now and I'm like, holy, we were about 20 years. Fast forward 20 years, we would have been right on it. But such is such is life right um so yeah i mean that that's the other good thing about companies who haven't really kind of taken the dive into digital transformation you know it's that classic second half of mainstream in the crossing the chasm uh, mar uh, uh profile where the good news is you got trigger mesh and you got these kinds of tools now that'll help you do it three years ago you didn't have that. Five years ago, you didn't have this. It was much harder to do it. So, you know, now, now is the time. And if not now, when is, is kind of got to be the mantra there, I think. Yep. Anyway, man, hey, we are, we're about out of time here. Um, Mark, stay well and healthy through this. Keep doing what you guys are doing at Trigger Mesh. Uh, maybe you'll be the first three-timer on, on Tech Strong TV. Who knows? I would be honored too. It's been great and I appreciate it. All righty. Mark Hinkle from Trigger Match here on Tech Strong TV. We'll be right back in just a moment with our next guest. Right now, software is more important than ever. 
It is powering the online services enabling teams to connect, collaborate, and work remotely, and allowing innovation to continue to get to market rapidly. CloudBees offers software delivery automation solutions to support all remote teams, and you can use the best-in-class tools you need to get the job done. CloudBees helps you build stuff that matters. Visit cloudbees.com to learn more. Okay, back here in the Digital Anarchist Studios. Um, so our next segment is, is, is our little bit of old for today. And I went back and chose this one. I handpicked this one out of our YouTube uh, DevOps TV channel. It goes back to, I think, 2018. And it, uh, it features uh, three women who are just all three rock stars in their own regard. Uh, Shannon Leeds, the founder of DevSecOps.org and the leader of DevSecOps over at Intuit. Uh, Paula Thrasher, who has a long, distinguished career, in, especially in the federal uh, contractor marketplace. And Carolyn Wong. Carolyn, <laughs> there's not enough good things to say about Carolyn Wong. Um, Carolyn actually will be featured next week on TechStrong TV with a, a recent interview with uh, Charlene O'Hanlon. But anyway, all three of these women got together for a panel for our DevSecOps event at RSA conference in 2018, and it was called Security is the Center of the DevOps World, and they each give a little bit of their own experience on that. So let me take you back now to 2018 RSA conference DevSecOps event um, for Carolyn Wong, Shannon Leitz, and Paula Thrasher. So uh, Caroline, Paula, and I have been working on bringing this content to you for the last uh, few months. And when we first got started, we had all these war stories and felt like that was a great opportunity to really help you to understand and navigate today. Um, we've got some great speakers, and it's going to be an awesome thing. So um, real quick, a little bit about me. I, um, I am one of the people who started DevSecOps long ago, didn't really know it, and then um, decided to finally name what it, it was that I found along the way. And um, I also uh, write comic strips and do crazy things, including starting things like trying to get more women into cybersecurity. So enough about me. Um, what you might want to know is why we're trying to get DevSecOps to be at the heart of the DevOps movement. And that's because security is something that's too important to leave out. DevOps has been growing as a movement since around 2012 when hiring became a big deal. And um, if you're trying to ground yourself in this movement, what it is and how you're going to take place in it, it's really about trying to put some understanding towards why this movement is so important. DevOps is very much a big part of why software is starting to take over and eat the world. And um, when you start to think about that, it's kind of interesting because um, more and more people are wanting to collaborate, to do things uh, with each other, and to really change how software is defined and developed. Why is that? Well, growth has been ex exponential in the cloud. And when we think about that, growth being exponential, that means that there's all kinds of opportunities and things that come with it. And along with that comes a lot of innovation. I know at my company, innovation's a big part of what we think we do every day. And we produce some wonderful things for our customers. But that's at the spirit of the movement that we have, which is defining customer problems and solving them. Ultimately, with the cloud growth comes a whole bunch of change. One of the big changes that came along with this was security. And if you think about it, back when, I think it was in 2013, Josh Corman actually gave a couple of talks. One of his first talks was, this is the end of security as we know it, with the cloud and the entry of DevOps. And maybe a little while later, he added, and isn't this a good thing? And as a security professional, I got to tell you, the first time I heard it, my heart sank. I thought I was going to have to change careers go back to being a developer or maybe even getting those you know, one-inch pizza boxes being sent to my house so I could put the new disk in. And when he said, isn't it a good thing, it really caused me to pause for a moment. And when I think about that, it's why we're all here today, because really this movement that we have, which is DevSecOps, is really about bringing more security to software faster, shifting left. You're going to hear a lot of these things today. 
start to you know, put some sense to it. And what I would tell you is look for things that are measurable. Today we're gonna to share a whole bunch of war stories. We're gonna tell you a lot of things as different companies standing up here, mostly practitioners, that there's a lot of change in this movement. So I remember when, here's my head banging moment, and we're all three gonna share some head banging moments with you. I remember when I first got to the company I was at, I'm at Intuit. Um, and uh, when you look at into its um, capabilities, I got there and I realized that we were moving to the cloud and we were starting to be DevOps. And while I had come from other cloud companies and I had come from other DevOps companies and I knew the journey was tough and I knew mostly for security professionals because as a security professional, I'm gonna admit to you, I was the house of no. I worked for a lot of different companies and I would say compliance was one of those things where you don't really deviate from compliance requirements. You have to meet them, you have to meet the bar. And um, knowing that is a really big deal. So for us, what I, I found was that it was really hard to try and understand the speed, the scale of doing all the things that you had to do well so that you could embrace security and software. I mean, how many in the room have tried to get security into software so, for so many years and only to find that their AppSec programs have really struggled? Anybody? Yeah, lots of hands. And I'll tell you, as a security professional who's also been a developer and an operations person, um, it's been rough. So I wanted to have um, Paula also share a little bit about her headbanging moment. Sure. So I'm uh, Paula Thrasher and I work for General Dynamics IT, which is a large federal systems integrator, and I've been in the federal space for a long time. Um, to give a little bit of my background, um, I was a developer for 15 years, and then I sort of took a weird left turn and became uh, an IT director, uh, operations manager. Um, and so I went from all of a sudden being the person who was sort of hacking the servers to the person running the servers that didn't want anyone, any developer anywhere near my servers because I knew what they could do. Um, and that was kind of my DevOps moment. And that led to some transformations um, and some journeys that, that I went on starting in 2010 when I made that switch. So my headbanging story was sometime later, and it was 2015. And I had just led a large uh, DevOps transformation for a program that had about 400 folks in the organization, uh, 28 development teams, um, you know, op IT operations, I had a whole security team. Uh, it was a great transformation um, and that was going really well and the DevOps had really, you know, just that whole culture but also the automation was huge for us going faster and getting great results. But we had a new requirement that came in and it was a new, new customer in a new program and as happens in federal, Congress passed a law in October, and it had to be active by January 1. So not a lot of time to build a whole brand new thing because you've got basically seven weeks. So we thought, well, okay, we know how to do this. That's DevOps. So we assembled our best team. I had a really hotshot UX person. I had great developers. I had a good cloud architect. We were, you know, cloud was non-negotiable in six weeks. That's, we can't even order a server that fast. You know, we were, we were gonna do all the things that we had just done at this huge scale. I had a, you know, DevOps um, automation engineer, you know, I had testers, we did automated testing. And over the course of that six weeks, that team deployed to production, which was to Amazon, um, not officially production, but production, right? Because it's the same thing in the cloud, 152 times. And if you do the math, that's more than once a day and they wrote 88 automated tests, and they had automated security scanning, and we had automated style checking, we had automated um, performance testing. Every time it made it all the way to production, it ran a big performance load testing. We were using a lot of components. We were doing component security. I mean, it, to me, I thought, we are like the model of how we should be doing security and DevOps, go us. You know, big pat on the back. So, the first time that I actually saw a security person in the course of that entire project was the Thursday before go live in the official, you know, go live meeting. We need one of those change control boards. And they show up and they look at all of our, and I go, look at all our tests, right? And I, I pulled it all up 
and I was very proud of ourselves. And they went, yeah, it looks pretty good. OK, green light, right? And I think we overwhelmed them with data, and they agreed. And we went live. And it was Monday morning, and people are starting to use the system. And the SOC calls. And they say, you're being hacked. And I went, oh, <laughs> how are we being hacked? Well, it looks like, and honestly, it doesn't really matter. It was 2015, and this is many years ago. But the gist of it was this component plus that component, and when you mix them together, you have a vulnerability. And then, oh, by the way, it comes up, yeah, there was a zero day with one of those components about three weeks ago. Didn't you get the memo? No. I would have been good to know three weeks ago when we had a decision. <laughs> and that was when I realized that waiting to the very end, even with all of this, you know, developers are going to carry pagers and, you know, no ops, maybe no dev, I don't know. You know, it, it didn't make sense that security showed up at the end. Even when we had all these automation, we still needed the expertise. And so that was the moment when I decided that it wasn't just, you know, dev and ops and we can figure it out. We'll do the security thing. Leave us alone. Because <laughs> you'll just say no. <laughs> we really needed to embrace having security in the room when we were making the decisions, not just at the end when we hit the, you know, magic go live. Good morning, I'm Caroline Wong. I'm gonna to talk to you about what it's like to be the security person that is not invited into the room. Uh, I am currently the Vice President of Security Strategy for a pen test as a service company called Cobalt, based in San Francisco. I started my security career 13 years ago at eBay and at Zynga, leading security teams. And these were super cool places uh, to begin my security career. Uh, in both cases, we were running online operations 24 by 7 with millions of simultaneous users daily. eBay had an uptime requirement of 99.94%. Zynga was growing incredibly rapidly and was an early adopter of Amazon AWS. In 2009, Farmville launched. Farmville was this like Facebook game that you could play on your phone. And in a few weeks, the game went from zero to 10 million daily active users. A few months later, it was 80 million daily active users. At Zynga, we also had these incredible data stores. Uh, one game would log more than 30 billion transactions a day. So in this type of environment, why does security matter? Well, there's compliance reasons. You don't want a breach. Uh, and in Zynga's case, we were getting ready to go public. So an IPO means you have to be SOX compliant. At eBay, I remember when we were doing a ton of defect discovery, lots of finding bugs, pen testing and scanning and getting information from security researchers via responsible disclosure. And every week it seemed we would go to the development teams and we would say, here's a pile of bugs. It's super important that you fix these right now. And they would say, they would like close the door. <laughs> and then they would stop showing up to our meetings. And as a security professional, this is, perhaps it's common. It's also really a bummer because it can feel like you're not accomplishing stuff at work. We were finding all sorts of stuff, but that's only half of the solution. You've got to find it and you've also got to fix it. At Zynga, we thought, oh, the company's getting ready to go public. We've got this big stick, you know, and so I did what I thought was the right thing to do, which is I took the NIST 853 standard, which happens to be 387 pages long, and I customized it for Zynga. And I brought it down to like 50 pages. And then I started trying to set up meetings with technology stakeholders to get them to buy into our policy. And guess what? Nobody would show up to my meetings. So we tried something different. You know, the CISO at the time at Zynga said, well, we need people to understand that security is not just our job, it's their job too. 
let's make a rules and, re and rules and responsibilities matrix. And we made this gorgeous RASCI matrix. And we said, here's what everyone is supposed to do. I'm pretty sure no one read it. And as a security professional, it's super frustrating because at that time, my head banging moment, which happened a lot, was why doesn't anyone care? Wow, both of those stories resonate really well with me. And um, when you start thinking about your head banging moment, I'm sure they sound very similar. If you think about it, why do we struggle so hard with getting bugs fixed? Why do we struggle so hard with making software safer? Um, it's a real big challenge. And I don't think there's that many security practitioners in the room who have chased bugs before that could say, you know what, it went extremely well when I turned over that really long CSV file with all those bugs in it to a bunch of developers that said, wait a minute, there's a bunch of false positives. Things are not exactly clear to me. How do I fix this? Everything got done, right? Not exactly. So the epiphany moment is something we also wanted to share with you. For me, the epiphany moment was very much about this Wardley map. If you're not aware of what Wardley is, um, a Wardley map is basically something that helps you kind of predict the future. What's emerging tech? What is more of your commodity? How are you thinking about what's important to your customer? And really, how does that drive you? And when I think about what caused our change um, along the way in many of the companies that I worked at, it was really getting customer focused. What does security mean to a consumer? What does security mean to a developer? And who's really driving? Is the role of the security professional to be able to figure out exactly what it is that somebody should be doing, making all the decisions and ensuring software safety with very little context? And the answer that I came up with was not exactly. In fact, no. And so when you think about this Wordly map, the cloud was making a, an emergence it came after compute when you couldn't get a box when you were a developer and you had frustration. And frustration led to the next change and the next change. And well, so many changes are led by frustration. And one of the frustrating things when you're working in the cloud and in DevOps is speed. If you don't have speed, you're not actually producing value for customers, in which case the DevOps movement, which is all about value and flow, value and speed, is something that gets crushed by security. And so my epiphany moment was sitting in a room full of people realizing that there was no way at the very tail end that I was gonna ever get them to realize that they owned security. That they were the people who had to ensure that security was baked in. We've all seen it, built in security, right? And that was the way forward, but how to get people to do it, really? And the epiphany led to well, this is your decision. I'm just here to help you make a good one. And so if you think about that for just a moment, what is it that the maturity of a life cycle like this looks like sort of led to the beginning of what is a maturity model that I hope to soon see evolved into many more things that have to evolve. And you're gonna see later on today that we're working on something like this. Um, but for us, this maturity model started with how do you change the culture? How do you evolve? What is it that you have to have for skills? Who has to have these skills? Is it enough for developers to take over security and really the role of a security professional is going by the wayside? In fact, we were all going to somehow eventually become extinct. The answer to that question is no. And it comes from what you measure. So if you're starting out in DevSecOps, you're probably going to measure things like defect density and SLAs. I wouldn't have ever believed it, but in my organization, we meet our SLAs for really critical bugs. I would never have believed if you had told me years ago that I was going to ever work for a company that could get to their critical bugs within two days, that I'd be part of a unicorn company that it could ever happen. But with DevSecOps, it did. And so when you think about all the things that you have to evolve, one of the first things you gotta evolve is who's really on the hook for making software safe? And then, if you think about it, measuring your defect density is a real measure. 
SLA adherence is a real measure. And if you're not in um, SLAs, you should ask yourself why. But the final measure that we came up with, and I think that I'd love to provoke this audience to understand today is, you should be asking your developers, your DevOps teams, how many adversaries does your application actually have? And I'm gonna tell you it's a turning point for every developer I've worked with because it's gonna have them looking for the adversary, interested in what they're actually doing to their application and not thinking about the FUD of what is being proposed out there as the most important things for them to fix. That was my epiphany moment, and it's led to a whole bunch of people that are really interested in security at the last few companies that I've worked for. And I would say that they are at the top of the list of unicorns. And what's great about that is that there's so many more coming. Today, there's gonna to be some amazing people in addition to these ladies up here with me that are gonna tell you stories about some of the new emerging unicorns. And it's because they followed a path much like this one. Paula? Sure, so I wanna talk, um, you know, the, the, the first epiphany of bringing security into the team and um, one of my recent epiphanies um, with some projects we've been working on recently. So one of the things that my team does as we come into programs that are adopting DevOps, adopting cloud, adopting infrastructure automation, is we try to bring a standard practice around a pipeline. And so we're trying to bring to teams that we have, you know, all the code is in source code. That's actually shockingly not as common as I thought it should be. <laughs> but that also infrastructure is in source and configurations and all of your executable files and your artifacts and all of those things come from source and they're all configuration controlled. And then eventually we wanna automate everything in the build, including the security scanning, static application scanning, ideally evolving to dynamic application scanning, getting into you know runtime performance tests. That's not like a big lead up, but something that runs every time the build you know, progresses to a certain state doing all of these things in an automated fashion, ultimately working to a deployment model where the infrastructure is deployed. Again, it's usually scripted. Sometimes that's with a, a Chef or Ansible, those are our two most common, and sometimes it's with PowerShell. Um, but all of these things are automated, and it, and it goes forward and it follows a standard pipeline. And we've done this for about 11 customers right now where we've come in, this doesn't exist, and we, we start this adoption model. But I had one in particular really take off, um, and that was interesting to me because I wanted to understand why their adoption rate was so much higher than the other ones were. Because we were building this really awesome tool chain, but why weren't teams using it? And so this particular customer, um, we implemented an, a new standard. So they brought in a new pipeline, and, and that meant that teams, you know, that even teams that had legacy things were gonna have to make some adaptions to get into this common standard. But what we did was we collaborated with the security group and we made that pipeline also include security automation and automated controls. We adopted some OpenSCAP. If you're not familiar with that framework, it's, it's a community that's trying to build automation in the security world. It's not everything, but it's, it's more than what we had before. Um, we adopted a lot of automated controls that as teams embrace that in their pipeline, they could inherit that control on their security thing. And it also meant we adopted, because we had this infrastructure as code, we were getting a lot of reuse. So we went from having about 60% reuse of design patterns and infrastructure to almost 90%, which basically means 90% of the stuff in our production is a reusable standard and not a special snowflake, not a special you know, bespoke server, as I like to call them, right? That's huge. Having 90% of the stuff in your infrastructure be standard instead of bespoke is, in, is a tremendous because it just takes down the attack surface. So why did teams adopt this when they weren't adopting, you know, basically the same pipeline other places? And I, I had this epiphany moment. When they used this pipeline, they got the infrastructure stuff automation quick and free and it made, uh, it was a time saver for them. And they got the security testing quick and free, and they were able to inherit controls, which took 85% of the effort of getting to, in the federal space, authority to operate, which is the big gate to get to reduction. So security made it faster. Security made it easier. And by the way, 
more secure, right? All, it was like an everything. You could go faster and you could be more secure because that was the big barrier. Sure, teams wanted to be secure, but I don't have the time, right? I'm too busy. I got deadlines. I promised the business I'd have this by this date. When security was actually helping first pace the automation to the other automation we were doing around infrastructure and code, but also make it faster and embrace that DevSecOps idea of, you know, constantly improving and constantly getting the system, you know, that constant feedback and speed, then teams did it because the trade-off of effort to get into this pipeline was immediate payback with the benefits they were getting back out. And that was a huge aha moment for me that to really bring adoption, one, it has to be really collaborative, but secondly, there's gotta be that compelling case that for the effort I have to put in, I'm gonna get something back out of it. My head banging moment was a lot about, I care about security and I feel like everyone else should, but I can't figure out why other people don't. And so my path to epiphany was not so much one moment, um, but really a series of learning over time. The first thing that we started to try and do was to ask some questions that we had not asked before. Specifically, what's important to you? Asking the developers and the technology teams. And what are you trying to accomplish? It turns out developers have things like quarterly goals and deadlines, and they're trying to make new features so they can make money for the business. And when we were approaching them with these piles of work to do, that did not instill trust. So what we needed to do was put some frameworks around it. And we actually applied a few different principles from Shannon's DevSecOps manifesto. At eBay, one of the first we did was data and security science over fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So we actually teamed up, conveniently, the CTO, James Baresi, approached our CISO, Dave Cullinane, and said, Dave, I need a security score for each of these applications. That was actually a pretty convenient, that was a pretty convenient thing for us, because then we were able to say, okay, well, what should that score be? And we decided that for every customer-facing website, it was going to be a defect density score so that we could normalize across more than two dozen applications. We decided that on a certain date, we were going to write down the number of bugs we knew about, divide it by million lines of code. That's our defect density. And then we, so once we had kind of buy-in from the decision makers, we actually, our application security team approached the development teams that said, okay, historically and truly, what kind of time do you have to work on this stuff? What's a realistic amount of work that you can put into that? And at the working level, we decided that we were gonna go for a 20% reduction in the number of vulnerabilities on the customer facing websites. Now 20%, is not a number that security people like. Security people like a number like 90. Security people like a number like 95. And if we had gone in and said, we're gonna try and eliminate 90% of the bugs on the website, we probably would have gotten the same response that we got before, which is people stop coming to our meetings, people stop inviting us to our meetings, people stop reading our emails. And we were able to do it, which was super cool. We kind of took it a level further when I was on the Zynga security team because what we did was another one of the DevSecOps manifesto fundamentals, which is business-driven security scores over rubber stamp security. So we would actually, instead of going to developers and saying, here is a pile of bugs, 
we would say to them, we've created for each of you, based on conversations that we've had with you about your business, how it works, the architecture of your application, we've created for you a studio risk profile. And we've got on the y-axis, bug value on the x-axis value to attackers. And so we were able to consider things like, and this came to us through our threat modeling exercises, you know, there's cheating in an online game, and sometimes it doesn't matter much. Maybe you're duplicating, you know, your bushel of apples, but you're not really hurting anyone else. So that's low priority. Maybe you're stealing someone else's stuff, their bushel of apples, and that's a slightly higher priority. Maybe there's a bug in Exampleville, which is sort of our, um, you know, game created by our shared technology group that you could then use to build Cityville, Frontierville, Yeoville, Xville. And if there's good code in Exampleville and it gets copied over, great. If there's not good code in Exampleville and gets and it gets copied over, you know, then you've got this multiplying effect. So bugs in Exampleville counted for more. There was a time when Zynga was kind of a big deal. And if a security bug was being talked about on a user community forum or being demonstrated on YouTube, that was kind of a big deal. So we were able to up the priority. And finally, some of the games actually had active secondary markets associated with the exchange of goods in game. If that was the case, that was kind of a big deal. So we were able to go in and say, not all applications are created equal. Not all bugs are created equal. We're actually gonna help you to prioritize so that when we come and talk to you, you can trust us <laughs> to take into consideration where you're coming from. The other headbanging moment I shared was with regards to security policy. And the DevSecOps manifesto fundamental that we applied in this case was open con contribution and collaboration over security only requirements. It's really different to go into a room and say, this is what we're gonna do, than to go into a room and say, here's the problem we need to solve, how should we approach it? So instead of me taking a 378 page document, making it into a 50 page document, you know, and trying to shove it down someone's throat, by hosting a workshop, inviting the stakeholders, legal, HR, IT, operations, networking, and saying to them, we're gonna, we're gonna go public, we need to adhere to SOX, here's what we need to do, let's prioritize, let's talk about it. From a security perspective, here's the bar that we need to meet, you tell me how we're gonna go about it. And we actually ended up with security policies that were signed by the teams who had written them and who were expected to adhere to them, signed and dated, which was super cool. And then it actually, made it such that they were going to follow the policy, which was also pretty convenient. Um, the last fundamental from the DevSecOps manifesto that I'll, that I'll share about is with regards to sharing threat intelligence versus keeping information to ourselves. Prior to my current role, I was a management consultant with a company called Sigital, now Synopsys, and I delivered more than three dozen what's called BSIM assessments. BSIM is a software security framework. If you're not familiar with it, I highly recommend checking it out, B-S-I-M-M. -M. There's an activity in BSIM with regards to sharing threat intelligence. And I talked to more than 36 uh, organizations doing software security and I said, do you share threat intelligence throughout your organization? And the vast majority of teams do not. At Zynga, we decided that in order for the security team to build trust with the other folks at the company, that we were going to tell people when something was up. So if our executive staff began receiving malicious email attachments, not only did we have the technology in place, Ironport, to strip out those malicious attachments, we also emailed them and we said, look, you're being targeted. We want you to know this is happening right now. Leading up to the IPO, there were all sorts of recon attempts, social engineering that was attempted on employees, and we emailed everyone and said, look, this is what's happening. 
Everyone was on Facebook because that was the platform through which we played our games. And sometimes people would get these fake friend requests from Zynga Security. We would email them and say, hey, this is what's going on. It's not us. And I believe that by being transparent about what was going on and not holding that information so close, we were actually able to have better relationships with the other folks at the company. Awesome, two great stories today. Um, so you're gonna hear a lot more um, as we roll on throughout the, or, uh, throughout the agenda today. And um, next up, we're gonna see DJ Schleen. Um, DJ, you're up right next, no? Oh, I got it wrong. Sorry, it's Derek is up next. I, I had a whole thing about DJ. Now I gotta talk about Derek. <laughs> um, so just a moment. Before we handed it off too much, I did want to kind of give, uh, like, from to the security professionals from Dev and Ops, <laughs> sort of a, a quick guide I think to the the culture transformation um, and maybe you know some other thoughts on that. But um, I really think there's sort of three C's, right? The first one from Dev Ops is that collaboration, that um, you have an opportunity and a choice. Collaboration is a choice. Um, to embrace the development and operations teams in the organization that you work. And if that just because they don't invite you, you know, just show up, right? Um, start that collaboration. I also think the more we can drive towards cross-functional teams, that is really a success criteria to me in a successful DevOps transformation. And in fact, when I talk to any new program, um, which I do a lot in the federal government because this is still a transformation that's very much ongoing, I usually say the first thing is if your teams aren't cross-functional, start with that. Start there. You don't have to change anyone's boss. You don't have to change anything else about who you report to. But make sure your teams represent all the skills you need to deliver and organize by features. That's a huge. And, and the third is competence. And this is a call that I have to the security community because this is where I, as a, someone in the development and the ops space, need the most help. It's not enough anymore for me to train my developers to look for SQL injection, right? That's great. My team just finished a serverless application. There's no SQL, right? I don't need them to know about SQL injection. I need them to understand command injection and component security. I need them to understand why so that they can apply that to the new technology frontier that we're all driving towards. And so that's why, again, having security in the room help us understand why, help us gain the competence to keep it secure. And that's why I love the idea of sharing those vulnerabilities. Tell us what it is we need to do and what we need to learn because we're out there on the brave frontier of new technology and we can't just take the you know, checklist with us. It doesn't apply. Yeah, that's great. So before we introduce the next talk, um, one of the things that I wanted to end on was asking the audience here how you feel that you show up in your organization. Are you a security professional? Lots of hands. Who would um, associate themselves as a developer? What about operations? OK. We got some more people that are showing up nowadays that are not just security. So by the way, with the DevSecOps movement, you're all three. Whether you like it or not, you're going to have to learn how to develop code to be able to look at the security of your applications going forward. You're going to have to understand all components and third party parts that are part of your applications and your software stacks. There's a whole bunch that we have to know one of the things that I would tell you that I'm now chasing is adversary return rate. Who here is looking at things like adversary return rate? That's awesome. Adversary return rate is how many times does an adversary return to your application and how often? In other words, if you're not actually reducing their ROI, which we've all talked about for many years, but with DevSecOps you can now do that, by getting enough instrumentation into your applications to be able to associate it with an adversary return rate. And as a developer, that's much like a customer return rate. So why can't we measure it better, right? If we're just really dealing with software, we can actually start to figure out exactly these things. 
So I asked a whole bunch of people in the room, how many are DevSec and Ops? You're here today, who wants to be a DevSecOps? I gotta tell you, that's the future. And like I said, whether you like it or not, it's where we're all headed because the cloud has caused us to all look at things differently. We're all moving in a direction. And today there's a whole bunch of stories from really big companies that are employing people like all of us to do this and to do it really well. So I'm here to learn from all of you. I'm a learnaholic, not a workaholic. I hope you find yourselves learning today as much as I hope to as well. And uh, I know I speak for a couple of us here that um, we all want to see you guys really be able to drive this at your organizations. Please reach out if you need any help. We're here to help. Any last words? No? No? All right. Thank you so much. All right. Q&A. There's microphones in the aisle, but they're not on yet. They are now. This is what DevSecOps and Agile looks like. We're doing Q&A now, all right? <laughs> Come on, people. Everybody's test, got questions. Test, test, all right, test. great. I have never heard the adversary return rate again. Uh, I work for a communication company, and we're constantly attacked. So how can you... I, uh, I would like to know just a little bit more about that. Are you saying that you actually are able to determine this adversary and is doing that and then they come back even though from some other angle? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, so adversary return rate is all about knowing who. So some of your threat intel can tell you who if you have the right threat intel. Um, you can also uh, understand a little bit of the, a bit, uh, a little bit about their TTPs, I need coffee, um, techniques, tactics, and procedures. And um, what that does for you is how your actual application is being attacked is something that can help you to determine whether or not you've got one or more adversaries doing the same thing. So hopefully that helps you to understand a little bit more. And return rate is all about how often are they coming? How often are you seeing the same, same TTPs? What is it that's being, how is your application being attacked? Thanks for um, all this great stuff today. I My question is kind of jumping off of this adversary return rate, and Carolyn talked about um, defect density. I'm wondering, you know, in especially in the era of, of DevSecOps, what some other good measurements um, and metrics that you guys use and that you share with the developers and ops teams um, to really help improve the overall process, security, speed, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great question. I know I've heard a lot from many people um, that are going to talk today. Uh, adversary return rate, rate is one. Defect density, um, de time between defects, mean time to identifications, another. Um, do you ladies have any? Yeah, I'd say um, I shared some very specific ones about how we did it at Zynga with the Studio Risk Profiles. I think more generically, most defects can be categorized according to criticality. And as Shannon was talking about, it's really important to have associated SLAs with different defects that have different criticality. Yeah, I, from a DevOps perspective, I like measuring the sort of velocity, the cycle time and the lead time that sort of gets you how, how efficient you are in your process. But from the actual code quality, um, I tend to look inside the team at things like cyclomatic complexity and defect density, but that's feedback for the team. That's not necessarily insightful for the organization because it's like not news to anyone that your legacy application has a lot of defects and a lot of complexity and your brand new shiny thing doesn't. But it's useful for a team and if you start Introducing tools like static application scanning or dynamic scanning, you'll start, or even just um, static code scanning, you'll start getting a quantity of defects and actually watching not the quantity, but the burn rate. How quickly are you burning those down as a team? Tells you something about the team's productivity and getting to a more secure place. As I'm passing the microphone back, I'll actually add just a couple more, um, which are, I think, like top end vulnerabilities is really important. So as an industry, we have the OWASP top 10, which is really fantastic for education and awareness. But to know a specific organization's top vulnerability types can actually help an organization to do things like customized training accordingly, right? Like, so Paula 
her teams don't need to learn about SQL injection, but they do need to learn about command injection, um, as well as things like you can also write custom filters for static analysis. You can actually use information like what are my top X vulnerability categories? Maybe it's top three. Uh, and then finally, what are what are recurring bugs, right? So, um, you know, great to know what bugs are there, but which ones keep coming back? As a follow-up to that, have you found that, you know, especially as you're going for those cross-functional teams that um, the security metrics and the QA quality metrics are starting to kind of merge more, more collaboration there? Yeah, I think all three of us um, would agree that they are merging, but I would say that with adversary return rate, that's a differentiator to quality. So your code quality is not really necessarily going to give you better rate, rate of return with adversaries. So it's something to keep in mind. Uh, we'll take one more over here. And then offline, all three of us would love to answer any questions you guys have. How do you balance your different DevOps, DevSecOps teams so that you still have specialized people realizing that not everyone can be an expert in Java development, not everyone can know .NET, not everyone can know Python, not everyone can know the firewalls. There, I've been doing this for a long time, and it takes a lot to become an expert in any one of these categories. And, and yet I'm hearing, oh, everyone needs to know it all. Um, I, they can't. So how do you deal with that? You know, I, I think in an organization, you have a specialty, and it's your obligation to figure out how to be an expert in something that people need. I go back to value and flow. So what's the most valuable thing that you can contribute to the teams that you have? In my case, it's adversary management. So knowing adversaries, knowing what they do, knowing how to hunt them down, knowing how to provide that information back is something that I do. Um, and I would tell you I learn Python and all of these things all the time. It's just you have to think about what your specialty is so, and how you're going to help your audience. So I guess more, more specifically, my concern is, yeah, I, I know Python and I know security and I know networks. Now, how do I tell my developers, no, you can't go start changing the network firewalls. That's not what DevSecOps is. All right, hold on. Um, so this is a challenge, right? And in a large organization, um, you probably have some degree of siloing just because you're huge, right? Um, I guess the, this is why I say collaboration is a choice. Um, the best quote I heard from a team, it warmed my heart, was, uh, this is from my, my teams all have mascots. Uh, and so one of our teams is the Tigers. And uh, they're sort of, well, they were working on something and somebody said, you know, we had a new employee come in. If one Tiger knows it, they all know it. And this is a team that has a crazy diverse background. There's developers, there's ops persons, there's a former networker on there. And it doesn't require everyone on the team to know everything. They collaborate so well that if there's a network vulnerability, the network guy knows it and tells everybody, right? And that kind, that's, that's why it matters that it's cross-functional. If you're living in your silo and you're not meeting with your developers on a daily basis, then they're not going to know that. I mean, so I think it's the fidelity of your collaboration is what makes that successful. Yeah, and I would just say one last thing on that. Um, my security team builds software. They didn't start that way. They basically moved a lot of our applications up, and that became a way to actually learn the things that were necessary to help everybody else with. And I think that there's you know, lots to be learned around not siloing, figuring out how to be experts, and really contribute back. So Mark's now going to pull us off the stage. <laughs> It was great talking to you all, and uh, we're really proud of this. Thank you. With the COVID-19 pandemic, it is important to protect yourself and others from spreading the virus. Prevention and personal safety is key. Here are the top ways you can protect yourself and others. Wash your hands often with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Avoid touching your face. Practice social distancing and avoid high-risk potential people. If you are showing symptoms, stay at home. If you must go out, wear a face mask. Always cover coughs and sneezes with a tissue or use the inside of your elbow. Clean and sanitize frequently touched surfaces daily. Together, we can prevent this pandemic.
Hi, everyone. All right. Back here in the studios now, it's time for our daily news segment. And as usual, I'm going to try to give you just a flavor of what we have out on the sites. It's not meant to be exhaustive or, or everything. I, I really encourage you to go visit DevOps.com, Container Journal, and Security Boulevard because there's so much more there. And I, if I just did the headlines and all the articles we put up, we'd be here all day doing that. But let me give you a little flavor. On Security Boulevard, two articles I want to bring to your attention. One is that the uh, Facebook privacy lawsuit or Facebook privacy tracking lawsuit, uh, it was the Facebook folks were trying to have it um, quashed or thrown out. And the federal appeals court says, no, that the lawsuit can't continue. So, um, I mean, at the end of the day, is Facebook going to have to pay money on based on, you know, damages for their privacy tracking, or at least is this going to be enough to, to stop that? We'll, we'll find out what the repercussions of the lawsuit are. But at least at this point, it looks like it's going to continue. Uh, secondly, up on Security Boulevard, you know, between GDPR and then, of course, CCPA, which is probably the most definitive privacy uh, regulation we have in the U.S. on par, comparable to GDPR, I guess, a little bit. Anyway, we have a good, uh, a good article on that, on what the rights of access are under CCPA and GDPR. And if you're not clear on that or a little refresher, go check out that article. I think you'll find it interesting. Um, for Container Journal tomorrow, or today rather, Thursday, we have uh, Envoy-based API Gateway Glue, G-L-O-O, -O, announces developer portal in version 1.3. So if you do use uh, Glue, check it out. I think you'll find there's a lot of good stuff in there. And then on DevOps.com for today, we have multi-cloud cost optimization for the enterprise. Uh, which anyone who's paying their cloud cloud bills can appreciate this, um, and it, and it's a way to optimize your multi-cloud expenses and, and some good practice best tips there. Check that out. Six common pitfalls to avoid avoid while building out your AI tools. Uh, before you put your AI tools up and running, it's important to be mindful of these common pitfalls. And then also in the how-to, under the how-to uh, branch, three ways DevOps can increase the value of organizational data. And data should be available at the speed of curiosity. Here are some tips for taking advantage of data so that it's timely, relevant, and digestible for decision makers. So, good, three good articles there on DevOps as well. You know, one, one thing as a result of this COVID is we find ourselves publishing more and more. There's more people contributing, our writers are, are all writing, as writers do. And uh, so we've got some really great content on all three sites. Please check it out. And uh, that's going to wrap it for the news today. We uh, go to a commercial break right now. And uh, actually, with no commercial break, we're going to go right over to our managing editor, Charlene O'Hanlon. So Charlene, take it away. She has an interview with Debbie Gordon. Hey, thanks, Alan. Welcome back to Tech Strong TV. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, managing editor at Media Ops. And with me here is Debbie Gordon, who is CEO of a company called Cloud Range Cyber. Thanks, Debbie, for joining me today. How are you doing? Good. Thank you, Charlene. How are you? I'm surviving. Doing great, thanks. <laughs> I guess that's all we can uh, hope for in today's uh, environment, right? <laughs> so uh, let's talk a little bit about, well, actually, first of all, why don't you tell me a little bit about your company, where you guys are located and all that good stuff. Sure. Uh, so Cloud Range is a uh, Nashville, Tennessee headquartered company, although we have offices um, throughout the U.S. and Canada and Europe. We provide companies with the ability to get ahead and be prepared for cyber attacks using our simulation platform. So our target customer and all customers are primarily enterprise security teams, um, blue teams specifically, security operations centers, and they use our simulation platform to go through exercises on a multitude of different cyber attacks in a very uh, emulated environment that looks like their own so that they're prepared just like a pilot would be prepared to fly using a flight simulator. Great, great. So um, 
Yeah, it, it, it sounds like a really uh, kind of good practice, if you will, for something like today's new normal, if you will. So what, what are, you know, I guess the question is, with things so different today and so many employees working from home, you know, how does this impact the security operations center? I mean, does it open them up for more, um, you know, the vulnerabilities to, to attack or, or, you know, is it, I don't know, what, what, are, what are some of the things that you're seeing? So, so much in the last month has been focused on what the security teams have to do for the company, mm -hmm. to prepare the company for employees to be working at home and having proper VPN connections and even people using their own personal computers. Um, so that's where the focus has been. And one thing I refer to is we don't want the security operations and, secu and uh, analysts to be the cobbler's kid. We don't want their best practices to fall by the wayside while they're helping other people be more prepared. And so um, as they're getting comfortable with what they have done for their companies as the employees have moved home, the security staff also has to look at what are their new best practices that they have to incorporate into their business, given that they're not in the same room as each other their incident response processes don't necessarily work anymore when they can't you know, lean over to their neighbor in the sock and talk about something that's on. And so they have to reestablish what their standard procedures are and practice them. So they, most of them haven't been able to do that yet. All right, so, so can a security operations center work effectively in this work from home model? I wonder. Absolutely, absolutely, they can. Um, and there's a, what we've seen just in the last few weeks, a lot of our customers have been saying, can we do some simulation sessions now that we're home? And our answer is absolutely, and you should, um, because even though their location's different, they moved home, um, they have the technologies, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the security technologies don't have to be um, accessed on-prem. Mm -hmm. And so they're able to still do their jobs from a technical perspective, but the human factor is where things can get a little tricky if you just wait for them to happen naturally. And that okay. goes back to communication and, and leadership and command incident commanders and who, you know, who's doing that and how are they doing it. Um, so that, that all has to be addressed. So we're working with a lot of companies. Um, if, if you think of a tabletop exercise, um, we do a very technical version of a tabletop exercise. It's, it's actual cyber attacks happening um, and simulating what you actually do in those attacks while they're working through an enterprise network, although it's a simulated environment. So um, they absolutely can function. Back to your, you know, your original question, they have to be deliberate um, and proactive, mm -hmm. and they have to re-prepare. So just as you know, everyone is re-preparing for whatever they're doing, the security operations teams have to do the same. Well, that, that makes a lot of sense. So have you guys, um, in, in your dealings with your customers, have you had to change the way that you go about training and, and, and doing these exercises um, to incorporate more in, in, the, in the way of communications and collaboration and, and you know, that interaction that normally would happen in person? So we, we've been lucky, I guess that's relatively speaking in this environment right now, but we've been very lucky in, in the sense that our service has always focused on security teams that are either uh, co-located with each other mm -hmm. um, or distributed or a combination thereof. So the way we deliver our service has not changed whatsoever, however, the focus of a simulation exercise where we had, you know, three months ago, if we had 12 people in one room and five people distributed out the world around the world, um, now it might be 17 people distributed around the world. And so as we go through these simulation sessions to reestablish their communication and, and dynamics, mm -hmm. um, it's just redoing, it's just assessing what their configuration is, if you will, each time like we do anyway. So it's just 100% of the people are remote. Um, and 
it's, it's pretty interesting because as you probably know, it's hard enough to get a lot of security people to be communicative, uh, even when they are present. Right. Physically. And so um, we have some really effective techniques that help encourage communication in a comfortable way. Um, mm -hmm. And this is obviously beyond the technology value of what we do for actually getting them to know the skills of detection, response, and remediation. Um, the communication and dynamics is, uh, I don't even want to call it secondary anymore. Um, it's, it's very important. Mm -hmm. And it's almost a, uh, an unintended positive consequence of all of the, the technical parts of the simulation that we do. Well, I think anything positive is a good thing, right? So um, you know, one of the things that I've been hearing uh, a, a lot over the last couple of weeks is with so many employees working from home, some of their kind of uh, security uh, radar or antennae, if you will, um, it, you know, they're, they're maybe not uh, working as well as they would in the office and they're kind of letting their, their guard down a little bit and I, a larger number of employees are falling victim front to phishing techniques and uh, other, you know, hacker um, infiltration techniques. So what are you, what are you seeing in that space and, and how can the security operations center kind of mitigate what you know what is perceived as an increase in that so you're and you're absolutely right there there is an increased number of uh, it's, it's almost like a double whammy because mm -hmm. you have the users are uh, distracted for lack of a better term mm -hmm. they're also there's a lot of uncertainty and so when somebody gets an email saying you know there's a a cure for COVID-19, they might not think the same way about clicking on that that they would have a few months ago when they receive an email saying, we need your social security number to do whatever to your, your bank account. Mm -hmm. um, so people are a lot more, more vulnerable. And so at the same time, and then obviously with people being more vulnerable, um, there's obviously more opportunities for hackers, and we've seen that in, in all sectors, you know, healthcare being one, but really, really all sectors because people have taken their eyes off the ball, whether it's the end users or whether it's the security teams. They're equally at risk. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's important that the analysts are not assuming that the security awareness of the end users is as it was a few months ago. They have to, know, they have to now regress a little bit and assume that their users have not had security awareness training, that they don't know that they shouldn't click on those emails. Um, and so they have to be extra cautious, so not only of, the, of those things, but just the fact that there's in just in general, a lot more distractions and, and it gives uh, more access for hackers to do bad things. Okay, so, so it's, it's almost like um, uh, employees really, really have to think, you know, maybe be more vigilant um, in these times of working at home and, and, uh, and you know, are, but are there, are there certain things that the Security Operations Center specifically needs to do to make sure that, uh, you know, the companies or the employees stay more secure even when their guard is down, if you will? I think um, a lot of uh, reminders, um, redoing some of the security awareness training that they have done in the past. Mm -hmm. If they haven't done it in the past or haven't done it to the extent that they should, it's a great time. And I always remind people just because of this situation that people are at home, we, we in general, the world has, feels like they have an, an excuse to not do things. Yeah. Um, but this is not the time to do that. So whether it's um, training. You don't want to wait to, to train people before they get back to work. You don't want to start doing simulation exercise or you don't want to stop doing simulation exercises just because people are at home. It's even more important than any of that because people are in a different environment and you have to you know, shock them um, to a point where they, you know, they're now, that's now their normal and, and treat it as their normal and treat it as it will be um, longer than it may be, you know, hopefully it won't be as long, but right. uh, 
can't we can't just use it as an excuse to delay training and awareness it's most likely more than a one-time thing too right i mean you know this this may be the start of a uh i, I certainly don't want to call it a trend but maybe there you know are something that we just do a couple times a year once or twice a year is kind of shelter in place and and work from home and and um but you know it, it kind of makes me wonder what what a company specifically you know they not within their what can they do for their operations, security operations center to kind of help sh kind of keep the wheels moving, if you will, um, to make sure that, you know, the network and the data and the employees are safe, you know, no matter where they're working. I mean, are there certain things that employee that companies need to do? Right. So, um, because a security team may have been really effective um, before this all happened does not mean they're going to be as effective right now. Mm -hmm. And it's not unlikely or unusual that the leadership may just assume that, oh, they were good before, or we thought they were good, or we haven't been breached yet, um, that we're just as safe with the people working at home. And so taking the Take, give, taking the approach that they have to, they have to practice, um, mm -hmm. that they have to be prepared in their other environment is very important. So um, we're doing, you know, and, and actually you mentioned this a couple minutes ago that you know just a couple of times of practicing something is not enough, mm -hmm. um, and people feel more empowered when they're practicing. But the 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 whole thing about the opinion of of a team being really effective is that how do you know they're effective without data? And one of my favorite quotes is from W. Edwards Deming. If you're, if, without data, you're just a person with an opinion. Right. And so we believe in always having data to support how prepared you are. Mm -hmm. And that may seem very subjective, but when you look at, um, for example, uh, mean time to detect and mean time to respond. Those are lagging indicators. Those show what a comp what what a company has done that quarter uh, preceding that time. But if we can actually have leading indicators where we're showing what teams are doing to decrease dwell time in a simulated environment, we're being proactive. We have data and we're showing a decrease in dwell time. So. It's very important that security operations teams and incident response teams are doing this and showing that data in a proactive way. Again, especially when they're working at home, they are the, they are more at risk now. Um, just like I said before, because they're in a new environment, they don't communicate the way they used to. Their manager is working from home. It's it's just very different, um, and those people have often not had that type of. Um, team building training that they need even in the normal workplace okay all right great so any parting words of advice for companies in this uh well in this new uh new normal uh well number one is to not put off things until things are back to normal mm -hmm. we have to keep doing things and, and being proactive and people just oh, and I've seen it in a lot of aspects of business that they're like, well, when I get, when we get, we'll get to it when things are back to normal, but there's a little normalcy right now. People have become used to being at home. There's a, there is a new normal, who knows how long it will be that way, but we have to, we have to be vigilant and we have to be proactive uh, and safe, both from a health perspective uh, and a cybersecurity perspective. All right, great. Debbie, thank you so much for taking a couple minutes and talking with me today. Good stuff. I, uh, I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Charlene. I appreciate it. Be safe. Thank you. You too. Thanks. All right, stick around. There's more Tech Strong TV coming up. Disruption is occurring across every aspect of IT. Open source, cloud services, DevOps, and cloud native software architectures are democratizing IT and radically transforming how business is done. The old ways of creating software and doing IT are being replaced with agile, flexible, faster, and cheaper methods, benefiting vendors and users alike. Accelerated Strategies Group is out to democratize access of industry expertise and knowledge. 
we use our expertise and experience to offer insightful, intelligent, useful information in a variety of formats relevant to the IT community, digital events, videos, reports, assessments, workshops, and implementation projects with tech vendors, IT organizations, and business leaders. We widely and openly share our work products, often for free. Analyst reports these days aren't worth more than a graph or chart that tells a story or illustrates a market trend. We work with developers, DevOps teams, cloud architects, security engineers, and transformation leaders most every day, creating and implementing transformational strategies and technologies. We're not just thinkers, we're also doers. Okay, back here in the studio, but just for a moment, because we're going to throw things over to the analyst corner with Mitch. It's Mich Mitchell Ashley, CEO of Accelerated Strategies Group, and Mitchell has two great segments for us today. Take it away, Mitch. Periods where there's a lot of disruption can of course cause chaos and confusion, but it also can help establish new patterns, new opportunities, new ways of working. And we're, I think we're experiencing all of that right now, even while there's a ton of uncertainty of what the future might look like. As you've heard me say in the past, we're creating our future. We're creating the kind of work and the way we'll work right now that'll be set the pattern for the next decade, for the 2020s, if you will. And one of the things I was reflecting on recently is where can we learn some lessons from teams that work in a highly volatile environment? And I mean volatile in a, in a productive way. I don't mean it's you know sheer chaos and nobody can tell up from down. But in our software world, one of the things that software developers and methodologies for creating software have done has gone from what is a very stable predictive process, this waterfall process where we plan out requirements for months and months. I mean, I was on a project during my career that we did requirements for, I think it was a year. I mean, it seemed like it anyway, to now where we're really dividing that up into much, much smaller units of work, much, much smaller definitions of what that work needs to be with a higher goal and objective behind it. So what I put together was, what I think, three really useful lessons that we can learn from software, highly productive software teams that we can apply in our work environment, whether we're software developers or not. So that first one is around setting goals and objectives. Think about not just the big, hairy, audacious goal that we're going to go after and, you know, kick whatever in this market and win. Yeah, we want to think about those two, but think about ways that teams can very easily set short-term uh, goals and, and groups of work that help them move the ball downfield. Because that's extremely satisfying, knowing that you're contributing to a larger effort and that the work that you're doing is meaningful because it's helping us accomplish those goals. And one of the things that software development teams do is work in very short intervals. They work in a couple weeks, what they call sprints. And in those sprints, uh, is actually developers self-determine many times what work they're going to do. Here's the list of things that we want to do. Go pick the next one off the pile. It can be in a Kanban board or other style of work uh, development or organization tool. That's a pretty cool one in agile groups and, and people doing DevOps. But it's great because here's the list of work. Go take the next thing. You want to do that. Or I'm going to take this section. You guys, you people know that I'm, I'm taking this on. I'm responsible for it and I'll deliver it and we'll, we'll have our, our um, integration happen later down the road here, but, but it'll only be a couple of weeks, maybe a few days. And that process of not just doing the work, but integrating the work back together, coming back together and say, well, I did my part, you did your part. It's all going into a greater whole. How do we integrate that together? And if that be a continual process, it doesn't have to be, let's meet together in two weeks when we're all done. Yeah, so let's do a stand-up meeting today. In this case, let's do a, a Zoom connection meeting or whatever it is for 30 minutes a day. And here, bing, 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 bing. Here's what I'm working on. Here's the next thing that's coming. And that leads me to the second thing that I think extremely productive software teams are good at. And that's open communication. Now, I know communication is always a good thing to have. It's always a problem, too. Everybody recognizes we don't have very good communications. We don't know what's going on. They, people don't tell us, whatever it might be. I've had the good fortune of, of both being on very high, highly productive software teams, observing them 
in the organizations, but not being directly on it. Um, I've also been on some not so productive teams that really struggled and just couldn't gel and get it together and couldn't figure out why. But one of the key things that I observed recently was a team that was already distributed. This is pre-COVID-19. Uh, this is several years ago. But the team was already distributed. And we're talking about the developers of a team of under 20 people. And there was no office. There was no central place. They uh, actually occasionally met in, in one of these um, kind of rent to work spaces where you could rent for a day and they go into a conference room and work together. But that happened rarely because people are in different states, different parts of the country. It happened to be a US best team, US based team, but it could have been international. And they were extremely good. There was no remote because everybody is in a different place. So they're extremely good at really leveraging the digital technology, using video, keeping video up and on all through the day. So we think of Zoom as a session we might have for an hour. They would have video up maybe better part, maybe all day long to kind of check in and out and have easy access to people. But at the same time, knowing that we're all can concentrate and get our work done. They use tools for messaging and communicating, all those kind of things. So if you're, if you're not working in a business environment in, in your office where you leverage the digital tools, this is a great opportunity to, to bring in Slack, a team or something that can help you communicate. And my, my encouragement is to get out of email. Email is not a communication tool. It's not a collaboration tool. It's a sender driven tool can tell I'm not a huge fan of email. It's great for some things. It's terrible for collaboration. And that's why I'm such a believer in collaboration tools like Team and Slack and, and others. So work on that. Work on that open communications. Because if you're going to be doing work in smaller chunks, more dynamic, more flexible, more agile, you're going to need that. You can't function without it. The third thing that I've observed of highly productive software teams that I think we can leverage is there's a sense of awareness and a trust, level of trust with each other. It's something that you build up over time. You just don't have that happen on day one. But if you work closely enough together, you start to learn a lot about each other. Sort of the quirk, quirky things, maybe this is what someone's good at, maybe they're not so good at that, and maybe we kind of joust with each other and have fun about those things once in a while. But we also know, know that, once we're more aware and we, and we build up that trust, that we can help each other avoid some of those pitfalls. You know, Mitch, those, this is a situation where Mitch can have some problems. So if he starts heading toward that cliff, let's, let's pull him back a little bit and help him get back on track so he, he doesn't make that mistake again or whoever it might be. But that also requires a great deal of trust. And what's behind trust? And you can go to all kinds of conferences and videos and read books about trust. It's hard to develop, but it's super easy to lose. But one of the key things about trust is underlying trust is a sense and a belief that people care about each other. If I know that you're, you care about me and what I'm doing and, and what I'm trying to accomplish or things that might be going on in my life in work and out of work, if that caring is there, that creates a lot of compassion. That gets, creates a lot of trust. And frankly, we often work in business worlds where that's not a big part of what we do. There's this whole philosophy of, of keeping work and life separate. Well, guess what? We're in a situation where that is impossible. It's impossible not to have the doorbell ring with the delivery person come or one of the kids show up with a question about um, something they're reading or some homework or something. I mean, it's, that's, that's the life we're in at the moment. And frankly, probably the life that we're in going forward. And that's really important because, and I'm not a believer of separating work from life, from your home life. Not that you bring every problem to work and vice versa, but you do. You carry all those things with you, whether you talk about them or not. It is impossible. It is not physically possible for a person to divide themselves down whatever percentage that's work and whatever percentage that's home life. So let's just kind of be wise about it and recognize that that's all there. Now it's even more present. But that again is another thing that creates trust with each other, that you've got each other's back that you're here to help each other. We may not know what the future looks like. 
We may be working really hard to figure it out. We may be even creating it, having a sense of here's opportunities of things that we can do. We can accelerate our work and get things done faster because this is now even more important to the team or the company or what are our customers. Uh, or we can work hard to figure it out together and acknowledge with each other that we don't know. We don't have all the answers. We're smart people, but we're not that smart. We don't have a crystal ball, but we can make some educated guesses. We can use data to help us get there. All of those things build trust. So the three things I talked about were clear goals and objectives that you set in much shorter intervals where people can determine their own work wherever possible. Open communications using digital technology there is no more mode anymore. We are all working wherever we are at that moment, at that day and time. And that's how we work. And we're going to keep the lines of communication open and we're not going to rely on short email messages to help each other. We're going to get on more collaborative tools. We actually have discussions, dialogue, and communications that we can manage into groups and topics and things like that. And the third thing is awareness and trust. Building that awareness of ourselves and of our teammates, what's happening in their lives, their work lives, maybe some of their personal life too, and, and building that trust so that we know we can count on, on each other. Because maybe tough times, maybe really tough times at the moment, and we're all struggling, or maybe, hey, you know, I, I kind of see a light at the end of the tunnel here, or at least the direction to head, let's head that way and make something happen. And I think that will help all of our teams function more productively, and frankly, we'll be happier, even though there's maybe tons of uncertainty or chaos happening around us. I think there's some ways that we can help ourselves and our teams lead through that and get to a better day and create the future together. DevOps.com is the number one online destination for DevOps education and community building. DevOps.com covers all aspects of DevOps, including DevOps best practices and tools, DevOps culture, DevSecOps, business impact, continuous testing, continuous delivery, and more. DevOps.com has the largest collection of original DevOps content, featuring breaking news, blog posts, podcasts, and more. Visit www.devops.com to learn more. DevOps.com, where the world meets DevOps. This is Digital Anarchist. Well, good evening, everybody. Enjoyed the meal? How's the dessert? I haven't had dessert yet. How is it? I'm saving that. If I do a good job, I'll eat the dessert. <laughs> uh, so as Philippe mentioned, and thank you for the, for the introduction, Philippe. Uh, my name is Sanjeev Sharma. I'm with a company called Accelerated Strategies. We are an analyst firm, so I'm an independent industry analyst an independent consultant. Um, and I've been, I've been in the industry for a while. Um, I said, let me talk about my favorite topic. And this is bright, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> I'm like, whoa. <laughs> you know, the brightness is at a different level. Uh, so uh, I've, been, I've been around for a while, uh, been in this industry for more than 20 years, which is absolutely amazing given I'm only 35. Uh, so <laughs> As uh, Philippe mentioned, I was at IBM for a very long time. I was, at, I was there for 15 years. And in around, around 2012, this thing called DevOps started bubbling up as a term. And something our customers started asking about. And I ended up uh, starting the DevOps practice at IBM. We acquired a company called Urban Code along the way. We started service on product offerings. And uh, I led that practice for a few years. Uh, my last role at IBM, I was the global cloud architecture uh, guild leader, where I was responsible for defining architectural standards for moving to the cloud, both targeting IBM's public cloud and other clouds. Uh, after that, I, as Philippe mentioned, I escaped, and I uh, started working for a Silicon Valley-based uh, startup named Delphix, uh, which I worked for around 15 months. And then since the beginning of this year, uh, I've been an independent consultant. And I've written two books. Uh, one of them is the original DevOps for Dummies, which I wrote back in 2014. There's a new one in the market now, but mine is still available also. I don't know how that works. You've got to talk to Wiley. Uh, and then the DevOps Adoption Playbook. Uh, 
So people ask me, you know, which book should I read? So my answer is very simple. The DevOps Adoption Playbook is for you. DevOps for Dummies is for people you work with. <laughs> so that's my, my uh, you know, way of introducing the books. Uh, so my topic, uh, as uh, Philippe mentioned, is, you know, how is adoption of modern application development and delivery techniques like DevOps impacting security? How does security change when we are going from a traditional application delivery, application release approach to something like DevOps? Because it has a significant impact. So we'll talk about that today. How many, let's do a survey. How many of you know what DevOps is? Okay, good answer. Now I want every one of you to give me a definition. Write it down on a piece of card and I guarantee you if there are what, 40 people here, we'll get 45 definitions. Because there is, it is one of those terms, because it is not a methodology, because it is not a, something prescriptive, it is an approach on how to do things, and we'll kind of talk about the definition. It's evolved a lot over time, and also several interpretations of that have come up over time. But that's why I wrote the book DevOps for Dummies to answer the question, what is DevOps? And the second book, DevOps Adoption Playbook, was, okay, now that I know what DevOps is, how do I adopt it? And how do I adopt it at scale? I am not the kind of speaker who tends to follow the slides. The slides are just there to remind me to stay on topic. So I would actually love it if all of you are interrupting me and asking questions. So let's make it interactive, right? I like it that way, and I would, you know, would love it because that will give me some feedback and tell me what to spend more time on and what to move on from. And so feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. Uh, Philippe tells me there's no closing time here, so we can go all night if uh, you keep, keep interacting. And, uh, and I know some of you have to rush out, so if you leave in the middle, I'll be deeply insulted, but I'll ignore it. <laughs> I'll just ignore it and move on. So let's talk about this, right? So this kind of the agenda today, we'll talk a little bit about the evolution of application delivery practices and where DevOps fits into that evolutionary curve. We'll talk about what I like to talk about the most, and that is the democratization of application delivery services. That's kind of my thesis. That's kind of my, uh, you know, when I, have, when I engage with a client, I talk about, you know, this is what you want to achieve. It's kind of the aspirational vision of what we are trying to, what the journey we are all on as we are improving application delivery. And I'll introduce a new concept. How many of you are familiar with the term chaos engineering? Okay, a few people. I think there's a high applicability in today's chaotic world around security chaos engineering. So we'll talk about that. And then I'll leave you with that in talking a little bit about uh, value stream mapping, which is a technique we use a lot in the DevOps world to help figure out how to get from point A to point B. And actually to define what point A and point B should be. So that's kind of the agenda. So around 20 plus years ago, there was this manifesto which came out and it was called the Agile Manifesto. And the thesis of the Agile Manifesto was that the way we were delivering software using traditional waterfall techniques don't work. You know, you no longer have requirements which are written on tablets of stone, requirements keep changing. In fact, most of the time, the customer doesn't even know what requirements are, need to be, and you discover requirements along the way. So the whole thesis of Agile was that I want to go from this waterfall way of move, developing a piece of software, then throwing it over the wall to the testers to test it, then throwing it over the wall to operations to run it, to a more collaborative manner where we are releasing software in a more iterative fashion, slice by slice, and discovering requirements and refining requirements along the way. That way you couldn't be wrong, because if you're wrong, in the next iteration you can fix it. The challenge with Agile was that it only talked about writing and making software, it didn't talk about running it. That resulted in 10 years ago, the evolution of DevOps. So if Agile was how do I develop the right things and how do I develop them correctly, DevOps was how do I deliver with speed and deliver business value. And something which is out of scope of the conversation today, but there's this new term which has been around since 2016 called SRE 
or site reliability engineering. It came out of Google, and they published a book called Site Reliability Engineering, and it's kind of shaking up the IT world today on how to do incident management and incident response, how to make systems which are more resilient in a chaotic world where half the stuff is not running on systems which you are responsible for because they're running in the cloud, or you're dependent upon third-party services. And that's the whole thesis behind SRE, which is how do I manage my reliability and make my reliability more predictable. But we'll focus today on the DevOps piece. So what is DevOps? It's an approach, right? There is no DevOps manifesto, which has been a problem because there is no singular definition of DevOps. In fact, I've written a blog post which is titled The Evolution of the Definition of DevOps, and I keep going to Wikipedia every two months and see what changes were made to the definition of DevOps itself. And every two months it changes. My definition is very simple. How do I get stuff here? Let's see if this pointer thingy works. Uh, I think it is too bright for the laser pointer to work. So how, I'll be the laser pointer. <laughs> how do I get things here from planning stage? Things that come in, change requests, new requirements, enhancement requests, bug fixes. How do I get it here all the way to out here where it's running in production and we are getting feedback? from the business value customers are getting and giving us feedback in terms of what they like or do not like about what we have just delivered so that we can continuously improve. And what we are continuously improving by using these principles of this thing called DevOps is four things. The first thing we obviously continuously improve is what is it we just delivered? If we delivered a bug fix, well, can we improve upon that bug fix? If we delivered a security patch, can we make the security patch more stable next time? You know, we did an emergency patch, but we need to make it a part of the product next time. We keep continuously improving with every iteration, with every sprint, as they call it in the agile world. How do I make that stuff that I delivered better? The second thing is, well, how do I make the platform on which it is delivered better? So if it's running in the cloud or it's running on-prem, it's a virtual appliance, it's a SaaS offering, wherever it's running, how do I make that better? How do I make that more resilient? How do I make that scale better so I can get better performance? I can optimize the cost, right? There's this whole thing about cost optimization in the cloud, right? I don't know if you saw this. It was like pretty funny. Uh, some people were kind of offended about, by it, but there's a video going out around the internet calls, you know, on, uh, on all around, our, you know, how uh, Hitler gets his AWS bill and how he reacts. Right, they've actually taken the, the movie scene from the movie Downfall and put subtitles on it, and it looks like Hitler just saw his AWS bill and he's really upset with all his generals. It's funny, and some people get offended by it, but I just thought it was uh, you know, a funny way of looking at things. The third thing I improve is the processes by which I just delivered what I just delivered. Are those processes as efficient as they can be? Did I communicate and collaborate properly? Was there, a, was there ways in which I can make my processes more lean and efficient? So I can know next time my software delivery and processes can be better. And lastly, which is I think the crux of DevOps, how do I improve the culture of the organization that is delivering it? Go from the traditional culture of siloed functional areas within my organization to more of an integrated, highly fluid delivery teams which are using new models of the way they are organized? How do I improve the culture of how I collaborate with my vendors, whether it is my cloud service provider or a security vendor or a managed service provider? How do I improve the deliver how I interact with them, changing the culture itself of what it is, uh, the organization that I'm delivering it? This, in a nutshell, is an approach of how to define DevOps, right? There are a lot of terminology behind it, which I'm not going into. There's continuous integration, there's continuous delivery, there's shift left. You know, for all of that, you'll get a copy of my book later on if you want to delve deeper. And uh, you, know, you can read, read about that. So why, why is security an aspect? Well, I'm sitting at an RSA conference. This slide should kind of be redundant, right? Because I'm sitting in a, in a security conference. But the thinking which is changing today, in my opinion, is not just the fear of all these issues which are going on, but we are actually seeing companies, at least I'm talking to companies, who are seeing that them becoming a better custodian of the privacy of, and better custodian of the data of their customers 
is now being seen as a competitive advantage. And one company which I think has figured it out completely is Apple. How many of you have seen that commercial, right, on TV about Apple where it's this lady sitting in a salon and she is reading something on her phone and she's just laughing away, laughing away, laughing away. You don't know what she's reading and then the camera just pans back and eventually it goes, what happens between you and your, and your, and your people you're communicating with needs to remain between you and the people you're communicating with. The Apple icon turns into a padlock and that's it. They are not talking about iPads or iPhones. They are just talking about how they are encrypting conversations end to end. Basically, they are saying is that their data, their ability to be a good custodian of your data and encrypt messages is truly a differentiator amongst other companies. And we are seeing more and more customer clients who I work with who are positioning themselves at that, saying that we are better than the other bank because we are better custodians of your data. We are better than the other healthcare company because we are better custodians of your data. That shift in thinking is today what is changing. And in the DevOps world, that has resulted in the word DevOps evolving into something called DevSecOps. Now, when that term came out, I was one of the loudest proponents against it. I said, you don't need to specify it. The whole idea of DevOps was that we're all in it together. Everybody, every stakeholder, including security, should already be in it. Why do you have to call security out? What, what the QA people aren't good enough? Why is it not DevSec QA ops? Right? What, what else can you add in there? But I get the point. The point is that security is a bit different. And I like the fact that they didn't call it DevOps Sec, which means security is an afterthought. They put it right in the middle. And that's the thinking behind it. And actually, yesterday, there was an entire DevSecOp days here, right here at, at, the, at the RSA conference. And we had, a, we had an excellent uh, set of sessions. Uh, and in fact, interestingly, the keynote speaker was the CTO and the CISO of Equifax. And they talked about how they recovered from after the hack, how they recovered from that and what changes they made. And it was absolutely a brilliant approach. And they're actually coming, coming back with this kind of a message saying, we, are, we learned from what we did, what went wrong. And today we are a better custodian of your data than all our competitors. Yes, please. It shouldn't be. <laughs> it shouldn't be. Secure DevOps? Well, that can be an approach. Uh, I just like the, you know, whenever I think of, whenever I think of that, in fact, uh, I, I tweeted this out once. It's the it's a image of, uh, if you are an Avengers fan, right, of uh, the Hulk guy. I forget what his real name in real life is, right? He's saying, oh, there is an Ant-Man and a Spider-Man. I mean, we don't need all these terms. <laughs> Right? The message should come across. Right? We don't need all these terms, but I, I see the point of what they are trying to make. But you know, we've seen FinOps there. I'm like, really? I mean, there is GitOps, which makes sense because they're saying Git is my repository, but to me, it's just overkill of, of messages. There's, there's a gentleman by the name of Gene Kim. He hosts the DevOps Enterprise Summit, wrote the Phoenix Project. He says, just call it Star X, StarOps. Right? Everybody is responsible for getting code to production. That to me makes sense. And as long as we are breaking down those functional silos, we are on the right track. But, you know, thank, yeah. But yeah, those terms are coming across. So what do I mean by democratization in the IT world? Oops. So let me give you an example. I love giving analogies. In fact, my book, if you read it, you'll, you'll see it's full of sports analogies. It's a, I couldn't, I don't, um, look at me. I don't play any sport, okay? <laughs> Exhibit A, uh, but I love sports, right? And one of my favorite sports is tennis. And here's an example of what I call democratization of technology. They tell me tennis rackets, the first one was invented in 1874 and it was made of solid wood. And then in 1947 came a laminated wood racket. In fact, my first tennis racket was my dad's tennis racket. It was made of laminated wood and it had real cat gut as the strings. And today, there's a company called Babolat, which still sells real cat gut strings, right? They're banned in my house, by the way, but, uh, but you can get that. Then came steel rackets, then came graphite rackets, then the current aerodynamic rackets, which are made of composite materials. That's all fine and dandy. Today, you know, players can do spin the ball and hit shots at speeds which were unheard of 10, 15 years ago because of the technology of the rackets. You can adjust the tension of the strings down to an ounce 
per square inch. It is absolutely brilliant. That's not the point. The point is that back when I started playing tennis, when I was in, in, in middle school and high school, to get a racket which was world class, my dad would have had to take out a bank loan. And we would have to special order it from Germany or someplace. But today, this is Roger Federer, for those of you who might not know. And this is my son. He's a freshman at Virginia Tech, studying business, with a minor in data science. He's looking for an internship. Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> Anybody? But uh, he's playing with the same racket which Roger Federer plays with when he's playing in a Grand Slam. And him and I could go online, order it for a couple of hundred dollars, and get it delivered the very next day. That's democratization of technology, making it cheap and accessible and available to everybody. That's the point here. When we talk about making why open source is doing so well, when we talk about why DevOps exists, the whole goal is to democratize various aspects of your application delivery pipeline. And I'll define what democratization is. In the DevOps world, this democratization and what it means to be truly democratized, I'll come to that in a second. But in the DevOps world, this democratization has taken a journey. Back in the beginning of, this, of, this, of the last decade, the democratization became, began with the democratization of environments and infrastructure. We saw the advent of companies like Puppet and Chef come up out of nowhere, right? And these were the hot companies back then, man. They were the, 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 you know, the, the darlings of the DevOps world. I remember in 2012 teaching a class at IBM called Chef for DevOps. Right, it's still on SlideShare and people still download it. <laughs> it's been like nine years, they still download the slides. Then came the democratization of software delivery and we saw deployment automation tools come into the market like Urban Code and Zebia Labs and Atomic and Nolio and all those tools. They democratized continuous integration, uh, Jenkins for example, right? Can't forget Jenkins. They democratized the building and delivery and deployment of software. Then, where I used to work until last year, companies like Delphix came into the play and started democratizing data. And they said, how can I make data available on demand in a secure and compliant manner and make, uh, allow developers and testers to get non-production data in seconds rather than in days? The next barrier which is being broken today and why DevSecOps has come to the play and which will, is the rest of my talk today is the democratization of security. The whole thesis of this democratization is that instead of practitioners who are specialists doing tasks, today they are making those tasks available as a service to the practitioner who needs them. So back when I was a software developer, many, many versions of Linux ago, I could not build my code. I could compile it on my server, on my desktop, but if I needed to build code with the application, I had to check it into a central repository and there was a build engineer whose job was to build the code. If I needed a test environment, I opened a ticket and there was some infrastructure sysadmin sys somewhere who provisioned the environment to me three weeks later. And it never worked, the environment was wrongly configured, but that's a different story, right? If I needed code deployed to a test server, I had to call somebody who would then go physically FTP the code over from to the test server. All of those tasks have been democratized. Today, as a developer, I can provision an environment in the cloud or in a private cloud on demand. I can build my code, I can deploy my code, I can test my code. The roles of those people have not gone away, but they've changed from being the people who do the task to being the people who provide the task capability as a service to the practitioner who needs it. So I don't need to open a ticket to get a task done, I need to just get access. This requires, and that is not beginning to happen for security, and we'll talk about what needs to happen in our world as security professionals to make, that, to make that a reality. But in order for that to happen, four things need to exist for something to be truly democratized. Number one, it needs to be self-service. That means if I want to check, do vulnerability analysis, it should be a self-service available to me, which I, as a developer who's building a code or building a container image, can run a process and say, show me all the vulnerabilities in this container I just built. I shouldn't need to open a ticket. That's self-service. But along with that self-service needs to come permission to act. If I had a dollar for every company I've been to who says they have self-service, 
but for the developer to do anything, she has to open a ticket or again get permission from three people, I would be a rich man because that's the process, that's the culture. So the self-service needs to be accompanied by permission to act. Where security comes in, all of that needs to be done with guardrails. There needs to be barriers which allow or disallow a person to do something or not do something based on the policies and the role access they have based on whatever role they're working as. So I'll give you an example. I was working with this bank in France, which is still in the EU, last time I checked, uh, unlike some other places. Uh, and they had development centers offshore, so which means GDPR compliant data could not be provisioned offshore without masking. So they put in a guardrail, which was a policy check which said, if I'm provisioning a test environment and the only place I can get the test environment is in a data center in Singapore, I have to first mask the data before I can deploy it to, uh, to, uh, to the Singapore data center. And when Brexit happened, they went and changed the guardrail and moved Britain, UK, outside the guardrail, whereas other countries remained inside the guardrail. So that's guardrails being developed, which allow people to do things confidently. And we as, and the practitioners can say, okay, you know, I'm going to try to do this action, if it allows me to do it, that means it is kosher, because the guardrails have permitted me to take an action, and it builds trust between them and the guardrail provider and the service provider, because as security professionals, you can say, yes, I have made it a safe environment for everybody to operate, if somebody is going to do something which violates a security practice or a compliance policy, my guardrail should stop them, and you're continuously iterating on that guardrail. The eventual goal here is to build trust, and it needs trust for this to work. There's trust for the democratization to actually come, become something which can work in practice. Any questions so far? Yes, sir. You have answered your own question, right? That is exactly what needs to be done. And there needs to be a re-examining of all the policies which are in place and questioning of why they are in place. We as an industry are, you know, if a policy gets put in place, nobody likes to remove it because it got put in place for a reason. And people in power are always concerned that if I remove it and something goes wrong, I'll get blamed. That culture needs to change. I remember working with a bank and they are explaining their to me, their key management, encryption key management policies. And usually I'm pretty good at keeping a poker face when people are telling me things, but I must have glanced at the, my colleague who was there or something in a way, or he's, I know that person sensed something and he's like, I know, I know. I'm like, yeah, you know, the 90s called, they want the key encryption key management policy back. Cause those things, people were, they were just refusing to change it. Despite the mechanism and tools available today, in order to manage keys in an effective manner. That's just an example of how you need to step back and say, is this the right way to do things? And I'm doing that at a client today where we are looking at some of their data management, their data strategy. And it's a, what needs to change most importantly is the culture. And it is somebody else's problem, cannot be the culture, it is everybody else's problem. I mean, how many of you heard it say, it's probably in everybody's literature or communication saying, security is everybody's problem, but is it? Or are they still looking at you to tell them what my problem is as security, as the, as the InfoSec owners of the company? I think that is the culture which needs to change. And you answered it brilliantly that yourself, that, you know, that, that culture has to come from the top. And the, um, the leadership of the company needs to tell people 
how they need to change and what that culture change needs to be. SecurityBoulevard.com is the leading resource for news, analysis, and education on challenges facing the cybersecurity industry. SecurityBoulevard.com covers all aspects of cybersecurity, including data security, DevSecOps, cloud security, application security, network security, security threats, and more. SecurityBoulevard.com has the largest selection of security content, featuring breaking news, blog posts, podcasts, and more. Visit www.securityboulevard.com to learn more. SecurityBoulevard.com, home of Security Bloggers Network. Hey, thanks, Alan. So Congress is working on some additional aid for small businesses. We'll see when that finally gets ratified. It's not clear to me it's going to make much of a difference, however. Most of it probably is spoken for already since most small businesses didn't actually see any money from the previous package. Of course, IT solution providers, many of them are small businesses, so we'll see how many of them wind up with some funding, but I wouldn't count on it. So, as always, we are left to our own devices, or as Winston Churchill once said, let's not let a good crisis go to waste. HPE and Extreme Networks are changing a lot of their payment terms to encourage IT projects to move along. They are also suspending a lot of the certification requirements for partners. So it's at the very least going to be a little bit easier to be a partner. Also, interestingly enough, AWS has suspended their IQ fees, which is what they call the name under which they deliver support from third-party experts. So I'm assuming they're going to continue to pay the third-party experts. They're just not passing those costs along to end customers, which is great because there will be a massive rush towards pushing more applications into the cloud. We will see that people will have figured out that their IT infrastructure is not as flexible and as resilient as they once thought. So at some point when the recovery comes together, a lot of people will be replacing aging legacy systems with either outright new systems or at least trying to modernize the ones they have. And that should create some opportunity for partners on the back end of this thing. Meanwhile, merger and acquisition activity continues unabated. Accenture is acquiring an outfit called Gecko, which is a IT services provider based in France. We have seen this rolling up of IT services providers before the downturn, but I think it's going to accelerate pretty sharply from here on in because there's just a lot of companies that don't have the wherewithal to withstand this kind of a downturn. Meanwhile, <clears throat> there's some new and interesting tools out there you might want to consider looking at. An outfit called ENV0 has a beta of a cloud platform that will analyze your cloud costs as you set up this self-service portal. The idea is that IT organizations are going to want to take more control over who's accessing what cloud resources when and then uh, dynamically see those resources and how they're being um, lined up against the budget that's allocated. Today we all know that a lot of developers have had a free hand when it comes to accessing cloud resources, but it looks like organizations are going to want to apply a little more control to that because, well, cash is king and costs are everything. Meanwhile, another outfit doing something related to the current trend is Tamer. They've created a bunch of data sets based on COVID-19 that you can then apply to your supply chain. The idea being that as the data changes around the crisis, you want to see what's going on with various elements of your supply chain and the fact that you may not be able to find a particular component or something critical to the business. So they're trying to make that a lot easier and it also naturally presents an opportunity for channel partners. Also, new and different is Qualys has launched a new agent, essentially, that can monitor what's going on on each individual endpoint in terms of where their vulnerabilities are, including all the way down to specific files, and then we'll pull the appropriate files via CDN from the software provider. So now I don't have to go all the way back through the local data center and backhaul all those patches. Each individual endpoint can call those directly. As we've seen in the current downturn, trying to manage security patches from a central repository that you're now using via VPN is just really hard, almost impossible. So I think there's going to be some new and interesting ways to 
deal with security patches that might become the new normal. Finally, just wouldn't be uh, a week in IT without somebody suing somebody. So Commvault is suing Cohesity and Rubrik for patent violations uh, related to their data management software. Not quite clear exactly what the root of the cause of the case is, but it is interesting to see that even in the middle of this downturn, we have plenty of time and opportunity for lawyers to keep billing. Hey guys, thanks for everything and back to you, Alan. Hey everyone, Alan Schimmel. We're back here in the studio to close things up for this great Thursday, April 23rd. Um, just a word about tomorrow's show. For tomorrow, Friday, April 24th, we have a special edition Tech Strong TV in that we're going to feature uh, the, the recent Qualys VMDR uh, virtual event in its entirety. It was about an hour and a half for a deep dive into the state of art in, 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 uh, in vulnerability management and uh, uh, management of your of your security so it, it's the it's a it's a really comprehensive platform that Qualys has worked on we have some interviews here with Philippe Corteau and and uh, and Sumed Thacker and and in the entirety of it, it, it all together it's probably an hour and 45 minutes worth of fantastic information so check that out tomorrow we'll have some other normal tech strong TV as well um, and, and then Monday back with our regular shows too. So hope you've enjoyed today's show. Hope you're enjoying what we've been doing here for the couple weeks now. I'm going to remind you, please come visit our community Slack channel at techstrongtv.slack.com. You can join it off our techstrongtv.tv website. Uh, and until then though, we'll, we'll see you all tomorrow. Have a great day. Say stay, say safe, stay safe, stay well and stay strong, tech strong.